the 2019 Dean's Diversity Forum. Good morning, Dean Johnson, faculty, guest speakers, and our distinguished guest. My name is Kimberly Creech, and I am the president of the Black Law Students Association, or BALSA, this year. BALSA is an organization at Widener Commonwealth and at all other law schools whose mission it is to increase the number of culturally responsible black, black and minority attorneys who excel academically, succeed professionally, and um, add positive impacts to the community. In the Harrisburg community, BALSA at Widener Law Commonwealth, volunteers at the soup kitchen at the Bethesda Mission, and as well as uh, works with the Nativity School of Harrisburg, volunteering with the students there to show them that there are also ways to become an attorney. You can see us, you know, you can aspire to be like us. Um, this semester, we have an event, and it's actually going to be next Thursday, February 28th at 5.30. It is our uh, alumni honorary reception where we honor an alumni of both Widener, Widener Law Commonwealth and BALSA for their contributions to both the community and the school. This year, our honoree is Anthony Cox. I, I don't know if anyone knows him, but he has made a huge impact with BALSA specifically and with the school. <clears throat> the event will begin at 5.30, and if you would like any more information, please feel free to see me after this. And thank you again for listening, and welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas Lavecchio. I'm the internal managing editor of the Journal of Economics and Race. And today, this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Dean Johnson. Dean Johnson has been here since 2015. He also teaches some classes. I'm in one of his classes, so I hope the introduction goes well. <laughs> and without further ado, here's Dean Johnson. It's a pleasure to, to be here today. This is the, um, I believe the fourth event since I've come to the school that I've had a chance to preside over. Although it's called the uh, Dean's Diversity Forum, I, I legitimately cannot take credit for the good work that goes on here. Uh, Professor Randy Lee is our organizer and pulls together the speakers and the programs with assistance from our Journal of Law, Economics, and Race. Uh, we also have to thank Sandy Graff, uh, Julie Sheldon, and all the other staff here that make this program such a success. We are really excited about this program. As many of you are aware, the Supreme Court has uh, created a task force on elder justice. And they are very anxious and active in moving across the state in an effort to, to deal with and, and work with these issues. We thought that combining our Dean's Diversity Forum with Elder Justice was a terrific uh, synergy there because oftentimes it's our most vulnerable populations that are affected heaviest by, by different problems here in society. So thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you, uh, you coming today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Alec Alexis Bacos who is the Senior Advisor to the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health in the Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As a Senior Advisor, she provides advice on programmatic, legislative, research, and public affairs matters aimed at improving the health of minority populations and eliminating racial injustice, excuse me, eliminating racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care. Dr. Bacos formerly served as Deputy Director and then Acting Director as the Division of Nursing within the Bureau of Health Professions at the Health Resources and Services Administration. Prior to her appointment at the HRSA, Dr. Bacos served as, am I saying that correctly? I apologize. But, as Chief of the Diversity Training Branch within the Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities at the National Cancer Institute of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Bacos received a BSN and an MSN from Catholic University of America School of Nursing, an MPH with a concentration in epidemiology from George Washington University, and a PhD in nursing from Johns Hopkins University. Her education also included three years of postdoctoral training as a cancer prevention fellow within the Division of Cancer Prevention at the National Cancer Institute. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bacos. Thank you. 
you just met? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Now let's hope I can uh, learn how to use this uh, printer correctly. Um, can I just test it out for a minute? I just want to make sure that I'm just push. Um, does anybody in here? Okay. All right. So I'll get started until then. I have some data slides, and I want to want to be able to sort of. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much. So what I'd like to do um, this morning, and, and first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here today. For um, I know that this was, um, uh, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity to focus on um, racial and ethnic uh, minority elders. And um, my background is also as a gerontological nurse. And so um, aging issues have been very, very near and dear to my um, heart for a very long time. Thank you. And um, just to also let you know that um, I actually, um, after my, my master's, um, my first master's degree, I decided it was important for me to work on Capitol Hill. I was very interested in policy. I was, I was sort of unique in that um, a lot of nurses wanted to um, couldn't wait to work in hospitals. I couldn't wait to really get my hands into um, health policy. And so um, I specifically um, went and uh, put in an application to be a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellow. And um, I still remember to this day, it was a very rigorous interview. And um, they asked, well, why would a nurse be interested in uh, wanting to work on Capitol Hill. And uh, my response was, well, we're the largest um, health work, uh, health care provider in the, in the workforce, um, I said. And so that's one reason. And two, I said health care makes up the largest um, percentage of the GDP. And so um, they were, you know, they, they listened to my argument and they felt, well, okay, let's, um, let's try this out. Um, but it is true that if you combine all the physicians, all the social workers, um, psychologists, um, that pretty makes up the, the number of nurses in this country. And so um, from my perspective, I thought it was extremely important and um, very appropriate that there should be a nurse working um, on the Hill. And so, um, thankfully, I was accepted into um, the fellowship program, and um, I knew right away that it was critically important. Um, most of the fellows were given um, positions to work in members' offices, which is, makes a lot of sense because the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, um, their wives actually raise money um, so th to support these, this fellowship program. And so, of course, it is sort of expected that, um, that you will work in one of the uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus in their office. But I quickly learned that um, oftentimes when you're the, the fellow, you're the low man on the totem pole in these offices. And so oftentimes the duties that you're given are to um, answer congressional mail. And so that's not saying that congressional responding to your constituents isn't an important thing to do. It's an extremely important thing to do. But I knew that if I wanted to make it a, a, some kind of an impact, um, that I really needed to work on a committee because committees are where things get done. And so I petitioned um, Congressman John Lewis from Atlanta, and I said, Congressman Lewis, can you please, please, please put me on a committee? And I specifically want to be on the House Select Committee on Aging. And so he said, well, Alexis, we don't have any members of the Congressional Black Caucus on the Aging Committee. He said, but you know what? I'm going to see what I can do to help you out. And he said, I'm going to call up my dear friend, Congressman Edward Royball, who was uh, one of the first um, Latinos elected to Congress. He was elected um, the year that President Kennedy was assassinated. And um, Congressman Edward Royball from East LA um, was a member of the House Select Committee on Aging. 
What I didn't know at the time was that he's also one of the cardinals on the Appropriations Committee. So lo and behold, um, what also I did not realize was that Congressman Roy Ball from East LA um, was, um, he came up, he was a social worker. And in the barrios um, in East LA in the 40s, there was a TB outbreak. And the only people that he could get to go with him to walk in those barrios and to go house to house to make sure that, you know, checking on um, people who had tuberculosis um, were nurses. And so he had a very dear, um, you know, kind of spot in his heart for nurses. So when Congressman John Lewis called him up and said, can you put one of our fellows um, on your um, House Select Committee on Aging? She's a nurse. And Congressman Roybal said, done. And so that's how I made it onto a committee. I was the, only, I was the first Congressional Black Caucus fellow to be, um, to be put on a committee. And what was really wonderful about it was, again, you know, as I mentioned, I didn't realize at the time how fortuitous it was that I should be on a committee that um, Congressman Roybal was on because, um, you know, the they're called the Cardinals. So those are the members of the Appropriations Committee. Um, and they pretty much, you know, if anything's coming out of appropriations, that's money. And of course, as you know, money is power. So it was really uh, a great experience to be on that committee. I was specifically um, asked to help out um, on one of the subcommittees on um, the House Select Committee on Aging. And so I was, um, I spent time on the um, Health and Long-Term Care Subcommittee. And um, I didn't even realize at the time that there were certain subcommittees where the focus was oversight. And so one of the things that we had to do, and this was during the 80s, so I'm, I'm really dating myself here, but um, a big um, issue was um, abuses, elder abuse in board and care homes. And so I had an opportunity by being on this um, health and long-term care subcommittee, we actually raided board and care homes. We just walked in, we showed our badges, and um, we we um, investigated and really assessed um, the state of these board and care homes. And oftentimes, I mean, um, I found patients or you know of these um, um, residents of these board and care homes in basements. Um, they some of them were tied to beds, and it was extremely egregious. And so um, I was part of that committee and had to actually write these reports. And then we had um, hearings on the Hill. Um, and then um, we actually had to call witnesses to these hearings. So this was an extremely, for someone who is in their early 20s to be doing this, this was a fabulous experience and opportunity for me. So um, that, that's why I'm just so excited to be here today and to be talking about uh, minority aging issues because um, very early in my career, um, this has been something that has been a passion of mine. So with that, now I'm fast forwarding to what I do now. And so um, as was mentioned, um, I am the senior advisor to the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health. Um, just to give you some kind of idea about the structure of our office, we reside in what's called the Office of the Secretary. So um, that, that's a pretty important um, place to be in within the organizational chart of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so we work very closely, and I'll, um, when I get to this in one of my um, future slides, um, I'll talk a little bit, a little bit about um, the other offices of minority health, which are within what we call our operational divisions. So our operational divisions are, for example, everyone's heard of the Centers for Disease Control and um, the Food and Drug Administration. So um, we, the way, the best way that I can describe it is um, my office of minority health, which sits within the office of the secretary, is so, sort of like the mothership. And then we have the other offices of minority health that are within our operational divisions, and we help to coordinate um, 
um, policy um, with those other um, offices of minority health in the operational division. So what I'll do today is I'm gonna give you sort of a profile of, just to sort of set the stage in terms of the demographics, um, in terms of older Americans. And um, I'll also give you an overview of the Office of Minority Health, why we, how we came to be, why we exist. And then I'll also go into some of the other federal initiatives and programs um, that, that are within the Department of Health and Human Services that are focused on um, um, issues pertaining to older um, Americans. So again, I wish I, uh, I'm not sure, maybe is, is this the pointer? Maybe this is. Ah, it is, all right, thank you. So what I wanted, the take home message with this slide right here is that um, you can see um, from the trends here from the 1900s to 2016, um, the, um, the expected you know, doubling um, by 2060 of, the, of those individuals age um, 65 and over. And um, these individuals age um, 65 and older represent 5.2% of the population in 2016 and will rise to 20, almost 22% 20 by 2040. Um, and um, the 85 and older population um, will be 6.4 million in 2016, and it will increase 129% um, to 14.6 million by 2040. So you can, there's clearly a trend, an upward trend, as you can see by this uh, bar graph here. Um, and so we need to, I mean, you've heard probably about the uh, silver tsunami. And so this pretty much I think is um, clearly, um, you can see the wave there that's coming. In terms of if you break down in terms of racial and ethnic minority groups, um, I think if you look, it's right here, um, the growth of um, elderly um, Latino population. Um, and this is again looking between, um, looking at the years up to 2060. And um, there's a definitely a growing trend, specifically, um, well, all of there's trend, there's um, pretty much flat um, between Asia, um, American Indians and Alaska Natives. There's some slow um, grow, growth trends with Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, right there. Um, but clearly, you can see here the rise among African American and Latino elders. Um, so that just kind of gives you a breakdown there. And then um, also in terms of um, this, this graph right here, this is a really, I think, um, uh, the take home message with this slide is that if you look at those um, elders who are, and this by the way is um, the CDC data, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention data. And so if you look at those who are greater than um, 65 years who report excellent or very good um, health, um, you can see that um, African Americans in terms of, oops, I'm sorry, um, right here in terms of about 30% of those who um, are um, basically well-to-do still report um, that um, only 30% um, feel that their health is in excellent or good status. And so that's quite, quite a, a difference in terms of when you look at just comparing overall um, or um, uh, if you're looking at um, white, um, uh, individuals over the age of 65, um, over 50% of, of those individuals um, feel that they, um, they report their health as an excellent or very good um, status. So why are we so interested in this at the Office of Minority Health? Why are we interested in some of these health disparity issues that you can see clearly from that previous slide? Um, well, there was a former um, secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services by the name of Margaret Heckler, and this was during the Reagan administration. And um, she was a physician, um, and she got some reports that there were some alarming trends in infant mortality, specifically when it came to African American babies and um, American Indian and um, Alaska Native babies. They were dying at alarming, alarming rates. And so she commissioned a report 
Um, and it became, um, it's, it's really, it, it ended up becoming known as the Heckler Report. Um, but sh there were um, a number of health outcomes that were clearly egregious when it came to health disparities. And to just sort of, you know, kind of wrap um, her arms around it, she convened a commission, and they decided to just focus on six health outcomes, because there were so many, but they wanted to take the top six that they felt were just so egregious, um, and to actually um, have this committee, this body, do work and research on these health outcomes, and became known as the big six. And you can see the big six there, cancer, cardiovascular disease, um, chemical dependency, which was measured by cirrhosis of the liver, um, you know, primarily alcohol abuse, substance abuse, um, via alcoholism, um, diabetes, um, homicide and accidents, um, and infant mortality, as I mentioned before. That was really the big driver was infant mortality. And I just want to say, um, again, if anyone has in this uh, room has ever taken an uh, epidemiology class, um, infant mortality is basically the canary in the, in the coal mine. So if you pretty much want to know about the health of any population, the number one thing, if you want to take a, just a quick shot of, of a, a quick snapshot of the health of a community, all you have to do is look at the infant mortality rates in that community. That will pretty much tell you everything you want to know about that community. So this commission um, um, looked at um, uh, these six areas, health outcomes, and then came up with um, the following recommendations. And I just want to focus on a few of these recommendations. Um, one was, um, if you look at um, number three, health professional professions development, um, and also number four, cooperate with um, efforts with, coordinate uh, cooperative efforts with non-federal sectors. Um, number five, data development and a research agenda. Um, and when they looked at that, um, the panel decided, you know what, we need to have a body within the Department of Health and Human Services that is going to be tasked with really trying to make sure that we keep our eye on health disparities. And so um, that's basically how our office came into being. So um, this is a picture, this is a photo of our newest um, deputy um, assistant secretary for minority health. Um, her name is Captain Felicia Collins, um, and she is a um, she is a pediatrician. Uh, although since I'm the gerontological nurse in the office, I'm I'm always. Um, re reinforcing with her that healthy age, in, in fact, her, her specialty within pediatrics is adolescent health. So I'm, I'm constantly reminding her as a gerontological nurse in our office that um, um, healthy aging begins in adolescence. So I, I always make sure I bring back aging even to a pediatrician. Um, but in any event, um, she um, is our latest. Um, uh, she's not. She actually wears two hats. So she is not only the director of the Office of Minority Health, but as I mentioned, she is the deputy assistant secretary for minority health, um, undergraduate um, Yale Law School and um, Harvard Med School. So she's really, um, really on her A game. So, in terms of the Office of Minority Health, um, our mission as you're probably not surprised, is to improve the health of racial and ethnic minority populations through the development of health policies and programs um, that will eliminate health disparities. And if you look at the functions right here um, of the Office of Minority Health, pretty every single one of those functions ties into those recommendations, those six recommendations that were part of the Heckler Report. So that's basically, the Heckler Report is almost like our Bible, it's it's sort of our mandate for how we operate. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention, and I talked briefly about this at the beginning, was our sister offices of minority health. So, as again, we sort of sit at the we're at the pinnacle, um, at the apex there, and um, but um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, the Centers for Disease Control. HRSA, which is the Health Resources and Services Administration. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. 
the Food and Drug Administration, and um, ARC, uh, which is um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, those are all um, operational divisions within HHS that now, because of law, because of the Affordable Care Act, have an office of minority health, okay? And the National Institutes of Health, because of the Affordable Care Act, because of Obama's Affordable Care Act, um, there was a, a center, National Center for um, Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health, and it elevated that um, center to an institute status. So it really made NIH also a major player in terms of um, minority health issues. Okay, and so in terms of examples um, of partnerships that um, OMH is engaged in, remember partnerships is part of what, what we need to do, we work very closely um, with state offices of minority health. So we actually have a regional operations officer in our office and we meet um, um, she meets monthly um, with the representatives in the State Office of Minority Health in Pennsylvania. So that's one of the collaborations that we have. Um, and of course we have um, collaborations with um, other um, entities such as AARP, um, you know, foundations and other organizations like the National Hispanic Council on Aging, to just, and that's just picking two of them of our partnerships um, in terms of so that you can get a sense of um, how we partner with organizations. So one of the things that I really want to um, uh, just um, bring to your attention, and I just want to like, give a time check. What time? I want to stay on task, so I need to fly through some time, uh, slides. Okay, about 15 more minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, in terms of the opioid epidemic, that has become one of the biggest priority areas within the Department of Health and Human Services right now. And so Admiral Brett Joie is um, the Assistant Secretary for Health, and he has been tasked with heading all activities to combat the opioid epidemic. And so um, this is actually um, not just a, a, a crisis for um, younger populations, but also a crisis um, for um, um, seniors as well. And so I just want to bring that to your attention. Um, and so um, a lot of times this has sort of almost like a collateral uh, uh, impact. So even if um, it's not necessarily um, someone, um, um, an, an older person who is um, abusing um, opioids, um, they're still at collateral damage in terms of sometimes you have um, adult, adult children who are misusing opioids and then sometimes the elders, um, their parents or their grandparents become the targets of financial, physical or emotional abuse. Um, we also know that the foster care system is being tapped out and that oftentimes these um, uh, grandparents are being asked to take in grandchildren. So I'm sure we all probably have, know of someone or even maybe have family members where this has happened to. Um, and so this is again uh, an increasing concern. Um, in terms of um, the opioid, opioids and elders specifically, um, looking at some um, CMS data, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service data, um, and looking specifically at Medicare Part D, um, you can see here um, that 31% of hospitalizations for opioid poisoning um, was listed um, within Medicare. Um, and so that is very concerning. And um, you can see here 12.7, almost 13% of, of emergency department uh, visits for opioid poisoning were listed within um, uh, those who have Medicare. So this is definitely um, a problem. Um, and just to sort of punctuate it a, a bit here, um, if you're looking at um, the, the chart, the graph here, line graph, and you can see that um, from 2010 to 2015, um, the number um, that have just increased in terms of inpatient stays as well as emergency department visits. This is a little bit of a breakdown um, by race and ethnicity. Um, again, the numbers are small here um, in terms of, of, of elders um, that you can see here who had four or more opioid prescription drugs filled. It's, it's small, it's, it's certainly nothing compared to younger populations, but 
you can see that um, that there there is some impact here, and um, and these are um, elder uh, elderly adults with, who taking any opioid prescriptions um, during the year, um, having their prescriptions filled during the year. And um, obviously, um, the, the largest percentage there is, um, in terms of racial and ethnic minorities, is the non-Hispanic black, which is right there. And this is whites right here. The other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is that HHS has a five-point strategy to combat the opioid crisis um, in terms of better uh, addiction prevention and treatment and recovery services, better data. We need more data, especially when the elderly population, better pain management, um, as well as better, better targeting of overdose-reversing drugs like naloxone and, and better research. There's also guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain, and this has been issued by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and um, there are three main focus areas here. One is to uh, determining when to initiate or continue opioids for chronic pain. The second is to, uh, in terms of opioid selection, dosage, duration, follow-up, and discontinuation. And the third, um, uh, is to assessing risk and addressing harm of opioid use. So I just want to make you aware of that because I know this is, um, you know, uh, an important from a national perspective, um, and should and you should be aware of this. Now, in terms of I mentioned that we have um, collaborations with other. Um, our sister sort of um, operational divisions within the Department of Health and Human Services. So. There is an office which is called the Office of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, um, and um, <clears throat> this office is tasked. Has anyone here heard of Healthy People 2020? Any people? Anyone here? Okay, so a few of you here, and so <clears throat> thank you. This um, establishes the metrics in terms of um, health outcomes for the American people, and so um, I want to bring to your attention that there is specifically. Um, a um, objective, um, you have, there are a number of objectives that make up Healthy People 2020, and um, there is one specifically on older adults. And what's really nice, just as a take home message here, if you go and plug in Healthy People 2020, you can actually go to that objective, older adults, and there's a link there where you can actually pull down data so if you want data in your you know, community on older adults, this is government data that is specifically that pertains to this objective. So this is very helpful to have, especially if you're doing any community-based assessments um, and want to understand the health of your community, especially when it comes to, um, concerns um, older adults. But this is um, um, all of Healthy People 2020, all of the objectives, you can pull down data. So it's just, it's just nice to know. Um, also, the same office, Office of um, Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, uh, put on a workshop last summer, um, and it was a healthy aging uh, summit. And the summit was focused on, lo and behold, healthy aging and how to maximize the health of older adults through prevention strategies. And so the goals were fourfold: one, to explore the science on healthy aging; <clears throat> excuse me, also to identify um, gaps in the knowledge as well as to promote prevention and to support um, individuals um, living, in complacent, uh, living in place, aging in place, and living within their communities. Um, and so that was a two-day summit. And then the third day was an actual workshop <clears throat> where the, um, the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion actually, as well as off OWH is the Office of Women's Health, um, ACL is the um, Administration for Community Living, um, and of course, the CDC, the National Council on Aging. And so they um, um, supported a workshop and they invited actually the state um, offices um, on aging to come to this workshop. And so um, they wanted to help to I get these states to identify what were the key priority areas um, in developing their action plans. And so, um, what we learned was, um, and again, this is from those states that did attend um, that, that third day, that workshop. These were some of the top 
uh, national topic areas, priority areas that they felt um, should be sort of woven into their state action plans. And you can see here chronic condi conditions and prevention health care. Transportation was a huge issue. Surveillance, and that's basically tracking of disease and, and health outcomes. So surveillance and education. Health literacy and cultural sensitivity. Mental health was a huge issue. Um, injury and falls prevention and emergency preparedness. <clears throat> and, and let me just mention one other thing. Remember in the previous slide when I talked about um, Healthy People 2020 and I mentioned there is an objective specifically on older adults? Keep in mind that some there are some other objectives that although it's not quote unquote labeled as you know um, older um, um, you know objectives specifically for old uh, elders, um, injury and falls is one of the objectives in Healthy People 2020 that by and large um, is a reporting of, of individuals um, over the age of, of, of 60 who have fallen. So it's primarily, it really is very um, um, aging centric, um, even some of these um, other healthy people objectives. So again, I, I can't um, you know, um, you know, reiterate enough how important it is to check that out. But these are, from a national perspective, this, the, these um, topic areas are where the, the states felt that their state action plans needed to focus on. So um, the, the Administration for Community Living has done um, a $3 million investment um, to support states in building their adult protective services. Um, and so they're calling it Adult Protective Services of Tomorrow. And so um, this is definitely something that you should be aware of in terms of um, trying to secure funds for your state. And um, I also want to bring to your attention the Elder Justice Coordinating Council. And so this um, this is this is an important council because it's charged with identifying and proposing solutions uh, to challenges involving elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. And why um, this is so important is that this work group actually has to submit. <clears throat> They're required by Congress by congressional statute to issue a report to Congress every two years. So that's big, that's important. And why is this important for you? And I've put this right here on this slide, so I hope everybody looks into this. This is if you, if you wanna contribute public input on what should be the priorities of this council for the next uh, two years. You need to submit your, um, your, your thoughts or your recommendations. The public comment period ends September 30th of 2019, so you have, you have plenty of time to do it, but don't forget to do it, um, because I think that's important. Um, I think that your voice needs to be heard. And anything going to Congress, then if by, by you making those recommendations, you're having an, um, an important impact on what gets sent to Congress. So this is critically important. And it consists of representatives from 12 federal departments and agencies that sit on this council. So you have the Department of Justice that sits on this council. The Office of Minority Health also sits on this council as well, but DOJ sits on this council. So this is critically important. So everybody here, take home message here. Um, all right. So the other thing that I want to bring to your attention, speaking about the Department of Justice, we are, we're collaborating with DOJ, the, the Office of Minority Health is, on um, data collection um, efforts because we're very concerned about the health of incarcerated individuals. And so one of the things I want to bring to your attention is that there is a explosion, there's a huge rise of elders who are incarcerated. Um, this is very unique. This has not happened before in this country. Um, and we know that they have greater physical um, and unique uh, physical and behavioral health needs. Um, older incarcerated individuals are thir thir three to 15 times more likely to uh, report an ambulatory disability. They're six times more likely to have a hearing disability, and they're four to five times uh, more likely to have a vision disability. They also have um, a mental and behavioral health um, is a huge problem. And um, what's, of course, happening is because now, for the first time in this country, we have this booming 
uh, older incarcerated population, for the first time, prisons are having to deal with Alzheimer's disease um, and other forms of dementia, something that they never had to deal with before. So this is a huge concern. Um, there is a report that has come out. I will um, would encourage those of you who are interested in um, um, uh, um, uh, in this issue. It's from the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. That's right here. So just um, either pull that up or pull in this title. Pull up this title, Google it, and you can download um, that information. And um, so this is, you know, this. Um, this is a landmark report, really, that's tried to um, give an overview of what exactly the magnitude of the problem and exactly what's happening with our older incarcerated um, adults. And wrapping up here, I'm just going to fly through some of these slides, but um, we also work very closely with the Veterans Administration, and there is an older veterans behavioral and health resource inventory. So I would encourage those of you who are interested in um, um, you know, if, if military uh, veterans issues. The biggest um, uh, thing here is I, uh, the Office of Minority Health actually has an ex officio seat on the, um, the, the Veterans Administration's um, um, advisory committee for minority veterans. And we had a meeting just two weeks, uh, two months ago, I'm sorry, two months ago, and what's one of the biggest concern? Uh, aging minority women who are vets. That is going to become a growing concern because you know, women are living longer than men. And the, the, the Veterans Administration is now trying to figure out how they're going to wrap their arms around this. So this is something that is looming. Um, I just also want to give a shout out. Um, I have this slide here, and it's because um, the Office of Minority Health is collaborating with AARP because AARP is very concerned that there won't be enough nurses to take care of this growing elderly population. So we're working with um, his, um, um, his, historically black colleges and universities to make sure that we're, we're putting more minority nurses out there in the pipeline to try to address the numbers of growing minority elders. And I want to bring this also to your attention. NIH has just recently um, updated its rules for clinical trial participation. This is huge. I don't know how many of you realize, but most of the clinical trials that are conducted in this country bar up to this point up to, up to um, um, this ruling just being released, bar elderly people from being participants in clinical studies. But meanwhile, most of the, the drugs that are being produced impact the elderly, but they're not part of the clinical trial. So this new ruling is, is in, extremely um, important for you to know about. And then just finally, I just want to um, highlight we have some Older American uh, Month coming up in May. The theme is to connect, create, and contribute, and that's being headed by the Administration for Community Living. And then the Office of Minority Health has its April is our Minority Health Month, and our theme is active and healthy. And so I would encourage you to, we'll be tweeting and be doing a series of activities so you can um, find out about that. And the last thing, this is the biggest take home message of all, and that is the Office of Minority Health, Congress has mandated that we actually have an Office of Minority Health Resource Center. So if you're doing any research in aging or any, any topics in, involving minority health issues, you can actually contact our Office of Minority Health. Not only will they help you do a lit search, but if you're tr trying to look for funding for a project, you can actually contact the Office of Minority Health Resource Center, and they will do a funding search for you and try to help you find funding streams. So this is a, a great resource, and this is all from your tax dollars, so this is awesome. Um, so in closing, thank you very much for allowing me to come and talk to you today. I know I, I threw a lot of information your way, but I think this, hopefully there's some golden nuggets that you can um, take away from this. And uh, please feel free to um, you know, email me or contact me. I have my business cards for those of you who want my business card. But thank you very much, and um, 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 I wish you the best as um, you continue the rest of today. I won't be able to stay for the whole day, but um, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Bacos. That was a terrific introduction and a great overview of the work that the federal government in particular is doing on elder justice and uh, elder, elder health for us today. I'd now like to introduce uh, Secretary Robert Torres. Governor Tom Wolf appointed Robert Torres as Acting Secretary of the Department of Aging in January of 2019. Prior to his appointment, Torres served as Acting Secretary of the Department of State where he previously served as the Executive Deputy Secretary. Most importantly, Secretary Torres is a graduate of our law school here, so thank you. In his previous state government service, Secretary Torres was appointed by Governor Tom Corbett to serve as Pennsylvania's Health Information Technology Coordinator. Secretary Torres was also appointed by Governor uh, Ed Rendell to serve as Dec Deputy Secretary for Administration at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Uh, please join me in welcoming Secretary Torres. Thank you, Dean Johnson, <clears throat> for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's my sincere privilege to be with you to address the relevant and timely issues of diversity, race, and aging in America. I want to thank Professor Lee for the invitation. It's uh, coincidental that the very morning that I received the email inviting me to be here, I was talking to our chief counsel, who's in the audience, Nika Jones, um, and I mentioned I need CLEs, and I would like to do it in elder justice, so please let me know if you see anything. But uh, Nika's in the audience, uh, Deborah Hargett Robinson, our deputy chief counsel, and Barbara Valaw, our director of quality assurance. So if I get in trouble, they can bail me out. <clears throat> um, again, I also would like to thank you, Dean Johnson, for your ongoing commitment to host this important annual forum. The implication of diversity in all facets of our lives continues to be a critical subject to assess discuss and decide how best to respond to it. Pennsylvania is among the top six states with the highest senior population. There are currently more than three million Pennsylvanians who are age 60 or older. This makes up nearly 24% of the Commonwealth's total population of 12.8 million, and these figures will increase in the coming years. Our population of older adults is diverse with different needs. According to the most current census statistics, the overwhelming majority of Pennsylvania's greater than age 60 population is white. 8% are African Americans, 2.5% are Hispanics, 2% are Asians, and about 1% consist of American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander, or individuals that consider themselves more than one group. By the way, if you look at Pennsylvanians, greater than age 85, the total percent of white American uh, residents uh, increase while we see decreases in all the other groups. However, it's important to note that these proje that projections clearly show, as you saw with Dr. Baco's presentation, that diversity will continue to increase over the next several decades, so we'll see a corresponding shift in these numbers in the future. I would like to provide you with an overview of the Pennsylvania Department of Aging and share some of what we're doing to address the issue of diversity as it relates to providing services for older Pennsylvanians. The department's mission is to enhance the quality of life of older Pennsylvanians by empowering diverse communities, the family, and the individual. We serve as the state unit on aging for Pennsylvania, and were formally charged by the Federal Older Americans Act and the Pennsylvania General, General Assembly with representing the interests of older Pennsylvanians. The Older Americans Act was passed in 19... 65 amid concerns about the lack of community-based support services for older people, which helped to promote its passage. This law promotes the well-being of Americans 60 years old and above through services and programs designed to meet their specific needs and to help them live independently in their homes and communities. These services include home-delivered and communal meals, family caregiver support, health services and home assistance, job training and volunteer opportunities, and protections from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Aging services in Pennsylvania are carried out through a robust network made up of 52 area agencies on aging that serve our 67 counties. Over 500 senior community centers, adult daily living centers, and the Pennsylvania link to aging and disability resources. This network is vital to ensuring that older Pennsylvanians receive the support and services that they need. The use of this vast network also highlights the importance of assessing the level of awareness 
cultural sensitivity and training that may be needed to support the needs of a diverse population. The following is a, is a summary of what the network does and the numerous services provided. The area agencies on aging advocate for older Pennsylvanians and coordinate a range of aging services at the local level, such as transportation, in-home services, meals, health insurance assistance, protective services, volunteer opportunities, and more. Senior community centers provide a place where older adults can congregate to fulfill many of their social, physical, emotional, and intellectual needs. Though, pro though program offerings vary, senior centers provide nutritious meals, social activities, educational programs, creative arts, health and wellness programs, volunteer opportunities, and community service services. Adult daily living centers provide a professional care setting in which older adults, adults living with dementia, or adults living with disabilities receive individualized personal care and therapeutic social and health services for some part of the day. Pennsylvania's link to aging and disability resources is a network of agencies that provide services and supports to seniors and adults with disabilities. The Pennsylvania link can connect individuals to all available resources related to care, medication, nutrition, insurance, housing, transportation, employment, and behavioral health services, and more. We also have the Pennsylvania Care Caregiver Support Program that has served over 5,000 individuals during this past fiscal year. This program helps to reduce stress on primary, informal, unpaid caregivers. The program supports individuals caring for a spouse, relative, or friend who requires assistance due to disease or disability. The program also <clears throat> excuse me, supports age individuals age 55 and older caring for related children. And again, one of the issues here, as you heard, is grandparents raising grandchildren uh, due to the op opioid crisis. Services may include caregiving assistance, education, counseling, and reimbursement for supplies used to provide care. This particular program is underutilized. Over the past two months or so, you may have seen a series of four commercials being played throughout Pennsylvania advertising this program, and that was our attempt to raise the awareness and the utilization of this particular program because it provides important services, again, especially for, for the issue of uh, grandparents raising grandchildren because uh, you know, we have this opioid crisis that we're dealing with. With regard to employment, Pennsylvania's Senior Community Service Employment Program helps unemployed, low-income adults age 55 and older with employment and training services. And typically, participants will work an average of 20 hours a week at a nonprofit, and the training is designed to help serve as a bridge to other employment opportunities that aren't necessarily subsidized. In terms of health and wellness, Pennsylvania offers a wide array of health and wellness programs such as medication management, aquatic exercises, health, health screenings, nutrition classes, and more. These programs include the Departments of Aging, Aging's Chronic Disease Self-Management Workshop, Healthy Steps for Older Adults, Healthy, healthy Steps in Motion, and 10 Keys to aging, uh, Healthy Aging. Over 29,000 individuals have participated in these programs during the past fiscal year. Protective Services. Pennsylvania's Older Adults Protective Services Program protects individuals age 60 and older from physical, emotional, or financial abuse, as well as ex exploitation, neglect, or abandonment. Over 32,000 reports of needs, which are reports that come in of suspected abuse, were received in uh, the last fiscal year with over 8,000 substantiated. Over the past four or five years, we've seen a steady increase, which is very concerning, obviously, to our department. So it's something that we are speci uh, paying special attention to and making sure we have the right resources to address those issues. <clears throat> healthcare insurance counseling. Pennsylvania Surprise Program offers free objective healthcare insurance counseling to individuals and their families and caregivers on Medicare, Medicare Supplemental Insurance, Medicaid, and long-term care insurance. Over 195,000 individuals received insurance counseling during this past fiscal year. With regard to help at home, Pennsylvania has the Options Program, which offers low-income residents 60 years of age or older in-home services, including but not limited to adult daycare, transportation, home-delivered meals, personal assistance and care services, home modifications, care management, home health care, respite, and more. 
For this particular program, we assisted 55,000 individuals in the past fiscal year. We also have different housing programs. Uh, Pennsylvania's domiciliary care program provides a living arrangement in the community for adults 18 years of age or older who need assistance with daily activities and support in a family-like setting. Residents are matched to home homes that best meet their unique needs, preferences, and interests. We're also, we also have two pilots going on in Pennsylvania. Um, one is called the ECHO program. And basically, it's uh, the ECHO program is, I believe, in Clearfield County. And they're, uh, they're, they're putting tiny houses, I guess is the best way to describe it, the tiny homes, on uh, individuals' uh, property to help adults age in place and, and have the support that they need. So that's something that we're looking at, piloting, and seeing if that could be replicable. There's another program in Wayne, Monroe, and Pike County that's called the SHARE program. And basically what, what we're trying to do there is match individuals who can support uh, elderly residents in terms of doing housework or some of the physical needs that they may not be able to uh, for a reduced rent. So trying to match, make those uh, matches work and see if we can uh, expand that program. In terms of meals, Pennsylvania offers nutritious meals through both home delivery and at local senior community centers. Meals at the, at the community centers are free of charge. Additionally, we support uh, individuals with the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, um, which offers compensation for personal grocery shopping. And we also have a program that's called the Senior Farmer's Market Program that provides uh, some funds for fresh fruits and vegetables at farmer's markets. Over 9 million meals were served in the last fiscal year. We also have transportation services that assist older adults in getting to and from senior centers, medical facilities, and other essential destinations, free transit on local fixed routes, and shared ride options at discounted Costs are available for individuals age 65 and over. And again, we provided 1.6 million rides in the past fiscal year. We have a long-term care ombudsman program, which works to resolve complaints or issues on behalf of individuals living in long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and personal care homes. This program educates residents of their rights under, the feder under federal and state law. Ombudsmen advocate for residents who are unable to advocate for themselves and ensure that they receive the highest quality of care. We served over 150,000 long-term care residents and their family this past fiscal year. Recent changes in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services skilled nursing facility regulations requiring person-centered planning is an important step toward ensuring adequate provision of services that are linguistically and culturally appropriate. Person-centered thinking is basically a process that helps to discover what is important to an individual, such as activities, places, things, and people, and what is important for that individual to help them live a better life with, while maintaining their health and safety. To better serve consumers, our ombudsman must successfully complete a training mo module on understanding diversity, issues, challenges, and approaches, and they must demonstrate an understanding of and the ability to apply the following com concepts. Recognition of one's own, own biases and how they impact the work as an ombudsman. Recognition of personal conflicts of interest related to diversity. Definition of diversity, spir spirituality, and other key terms. Awareness of why understanding diversity is important. Presentation of self in an approachable, non-judgmental, and open way to people of varying backgrounds. Cultural factors in communication and overcoming barriers created by differences. Awareness of isolation caused by differences among residents, staff, and families. We seek every opportunity to utilize language resources available, including bilingual and trilingual certified ombudsmen, certified interpreters, including American Sign Language, verified translation of core documents, including Know Your Residence Rights, which is available in eight languages, including Braille, our social media recruitment videos, independent, independent study modules, and training webinars, are open caption for the hearing impaired, and the office offers annual training specific to preventing anti-LGBTQ bias between consumers, staff, and across aging services. Prescriptions, Pennsylvania Prescription Assistance Program for Older Adults, referred to as PACE and PACENET, offer low-cost prescription medication to qualified residents aged 65 and older. Eligibility for PACE and PACENET is determined by the previous calendar year income and the enrollment process 
for PACE also includes an evaluation of eligibility for additional programs such as Medicare Part D, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, and the Property Tax Rent Rebate Program. We served over 259,000 individuals, and as a result, they were able to afford uh, their medication over this past fiscal year as a result of this program. Over the past several years, the PACE program has worked with the Department's Cultural Diversity Advisory Council to target non-English speaking residents in the Commonwealth. Specifically, we've targeted the Asian community, communities in southeastern Pennsylvania, predominantly in and around Philadelphia. We have learned that to effectively outreach and enroll these populations into state and federal benefits such as Medicare, Medicaid, and PACE, you need to work through trusted organizations in the community that are staffed with individuals fluent in the language and cultures of the various populations that we are targeting, such as Asians, Indian, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Filipino, and Cambodian. To this end, the PACE program has staff application service centers in two well-respected community organizations in, Phil in Philadelphia. One is the Penn Asian Senior Services, and the other is the Southeast Asian Mutual Assistance Association Coalition. The PACE staff at these two sites conduct numerous community events, offer advice and guidance to residents, prepare application, and help with appeals where necessary. As a, result, as a result of these special outreach efforts, we have been able to enroll several thousand non-English speaking individuals in federal and state benefits that provide critical health care and cash benefits that otherwise would not be there for these individuals. We need to expand outreach efforts like this to make sure all eligible residents can take advantage of these services. The Department of Aging has a Cultural Div Diversity Advisory Council that advises the department to ensure that our aging network and the services provided are accessible, culturally appropriate, and, responses to, and responsive to diverse needs, and inclusive of all older people, including those that come from various cultural backgrounds, are limited English proficient, or are, or are disabled. This council has helped to develop an online training on human diversity and cultural competen competency that provides awareness, sensitivity, and skills when working in cross-cultural situations. One of their priorities this year will be to conduct a cultural competence assessment of all the area agencies on aging to obtain information on cultural diversity activities, successes, and challenges. They will also, this will also allow us to use these results to make appropriate recommendations. They'll also work to identify best practice and to share that with the network as resource for, for their use. As you can see, Pennsylvania offers many services and support for older Pennsylvanians funded with our state lottery and federal funds. As Pennsylvania's populations continue to diversify, it is imperative that our department and all the organizations that are part of that network deliver these services and are thinking strategically and planning ahead to meet the diverse needs of older Pennsylvanians. In closing, I would like to say that my personal goals are to ensure that the Department of Aging continues to leverage and strengthen the outreach practices we have conducted that have been successful in serving diverse populations. I want to ensure that our partners are employing best practices in dealing with diverse po populations and that we support them with training and other resources where necessary. I want to make the best use of data, such as health statistics and information from other agencies, such as the Department of Health, and Department of Human Services to evaluate how health disparities and or mental health issues are impacting uh, these communities now, evaluate the implication of those trends as the communities age so that we can develop effective, effective and strategic interventions. And finally, I want to make sure that we maintain and seek diverse representation on all advisory councils and committee that advise the department. This includes going beyond racial representation and making sure we have fair representation of other groups, such as veterans, disabled individuals, and, mem and members of the LGBTQ community. I trust you will enjoy today's program. More importantly, I hope we take the lessons learned today and apply them to make Pennsylvania a welcoming, safe, and quality environment where Pennsylvanians can age with the dignity and respect that I'm sure all of us will want for ourselves. Thank you. A terrific overview about what's going on at the federal level and also at the, the state level. So thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, probably between five and ten minutes uh, for some questions. Um,
please, yes. The question was, what, what's the role of our department in dealing with nursing home issues? There's been some, some incidents that have been reported in the media. Um, our role as a department is basically to advocate. So our ombudsman program um, serves as an advocate for residents in, in nursing home that may have some issues. Um, really, Department of Health, as the licensing entity, is the one that has to deal with the quality issues and the licensing issues when those types of situations occur. So our role is advocating, making sure that as we become aware of any, any situations, we will engage with Department of Health or Department of Human Services if necessary and make sure they're aware. And so we're, we're working to get, you know, collaboratively to, to at least make each other aware of those issues. Yeah. Again, our role would be if, if the, say, a elderly person comes in and, and, and complains, um, we'll, we'll follow up um, with the appropriate agency. If it's a, a Medicaid issue, obviously that will go to Department of Health, I mean, uh, Department of Human Services. If it's a, a quality issue at a nursing home, that would be Department of Health. Um, so so, so we'll, we'll help as best we can, but again, um, some of those issues you're describing would be out, outside of our our responsibility. Yeah, man, I just thought we needed to move on. I appreciate it. <laughs> Other questions? My budget is 80% lottery, 20% federal. <laughs> the good news is. <laughs> 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 The, the, the good news is there was expanded uh, expanded game gaming uh, last year. The legislature passed some uh, some new gaming that that's allowed, and as a result, they're projecting you know healthy revenues and profits. So that's all good for our seniors. Yeah. Perfect. Another question. I have I have two questions, and one question actually for each of them is is if there was only one thing that you could work on. In your positions right now, what what would that be? What would you consider the one most important uh, issues? Not that they're not all important, but is there one thing in particular that uh, that you would like to think about? <laughs> oh my God, that's so hard! Wow. Um, you know, I think probably for me, um, I would I would probably say. Um, okay, sorry, that's the mic. I, I'm just probably going to say I think that we need more data. We need um, we need to understand the health needs of the aging incarcerated because um, I think they're often are a forgotten group. And so I think if I had to choose one thing, I would choose that because. Um, you know, they're behind walls and, um, you know, they're sort of out of sight, out of mind for a lot of people. And so I think they are, um, in terms of uh, the, the forgotten um, and the one individuals who um, just really don't have advocates. And um, it just pains me to, I have a mother who has Alzheimer's disease. I've had to move her in with me. So it's made it very interesting with my three children, but um, 
that's what you do with your family. And um, when I see the rise of Alzheimer's in our um, incarcerated population, it just breaks my heart. And who knows how they're being cared for. Um, but then just writ large, um, the overall prison population, um, we tried to make inroads during the Obama administration. We were making really great strides under the Obama administration with um, trying to get um, the Department of Justice, specifically their Bureau of Justice Statistics, to collect data on the health outcomes of incarcerated individuals. And, and then with the new administration, it's been, we've been told by the DOJ that it's very clear that health is not important to them. And so it's been a struggle now. Um, I actually am trying to secure a fellow through the National Science Foundation to just, um, to, to basically put that, embed that fellow within the DOJ because the Justice Department previously was receptive um, to working with us on and, and collecting health outcomes of the incarcerated um, uh, population, but um, now they're, they're not so much. And so they said, unless you come with funds or, or actually come with an individual, not just an individual who will co help collect the data, but an individual who will actually be physically in lo on location um, within the Bureau of Justice Statistics at DOJ, um, that they would not entertain that um, idea. So, um, and, and, and part of this is because, you know, uh, collecting of that kind of data is very sensitive. And so they, um, so it's understood that I understand why they want the person there physically. But, um, so I'm trying to secure all kinds of routes, other routes to try to get that assistance, like I said, even by contacting folks at the National Science Foundation to help us out. So it, to me, that is, if that's the kind of thing, if I didn't, if I don't try to do that, it's probably not gonna happen. And so for me, that is probably the number one thing I would say um, out of like the 100 things that I would probably wanna put on the list. Terrific, uh, Secretary Torres, you can wind up our panel with your discussion. Sure, um, uh, hopefully this is not a cop out, but I, I, I can't see myself picking just one thing. And the, <laughs> and the reason is because as you saw from all the services that we provide, each of those services impact elderly people in, in very serious ways, right? Mm -hmm. to, so, so the one thing I would say is I tend to look at things systematically. You saw the network that we use, the, the area agencies on aging, the senior community center. So my, my goal for the time, during the time that I, I have this office is to really make sure that the system is working the way it's intended, that all these partners work together. And if we have gaps or deficiencies that impact our ability to deliver good services, that we're addressing them very clearly and very directly. So that's would be my, my one. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a, a 10 minute break and then I'd like to remind all of you that we have a lunch at one o'clock. So please, if you can factor that into your schedule today, that'd be, uh, be terrific. So thank you. All right, is everybody ready to begin? So before we start on the second page that was handed out when you came in, all of the materials are available now. The link to that for today's program, the slides and other material, if you wanna to go to that site, that starts with cwwjler.com to view those. And without further ado, here's our moderator, Professor Kearney. 
Oh, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to see you all here. Welcome to our second panel session, uh, which features three speakers. Our format is going to be that each of the speakers will make her remarks, and then we'll open the floor up to questions and further discussion. Um, our first speaker, Karen Jones, is president and chief executive officer of the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging and the NCB Housing Management and Development Corporation in Washington, D.C. Um, NCBA is one of the largest minority-focused organizations in the country and is recognized as the national leader in senior housing, employment, and health and advocacy on behalf of minority older adults. Um, Prior to becoming the NCBA's chief executive officer, Ms. Jones was executive director of federal relations with SBC Telecommunications, now no, AT&T, uh, also based in Washington, D.C. However, Ms. Jones uh, hails from San Antonio, Texas, and for eight years served in the Texas State Legislature uh, representing San Antonio and served on several committees there. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Jones. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I always, when I'm speaking, uh, particularly at uh, colleges and universities, remind students that when we start talking about statistics on aging and we list from 2060, we're talking about you. <laughs> we have a tendency to think that when you're talking about older people, it's them. And I must tell you, I've been in your shoes because I, for years, would speak and talk about them and grandparents and raising grandchildren and them and them and them. And it dawned on me one day when I was speaking, uh, I'm a grandmother, and I'm not a them anymore. I'm a us. <laughs> and so uh, I just want you to remember, when you see those statistics, and particularly when it goes out as far as 2060, we're talking about you. So that's why you have a vested interest in anything we talk about in terms of aging and getting older and aging with dignity and grace. Um, let me just tell you briefly about the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging, NCBA. We are a 50-year-old organization. We're based in Washington, D.C. We serve uh, in 50, uh, 15 different states. We develop, manage, own uh, housing, senior housing, Section 202 properties. We do health and wellness programs, uh, specifically gearing ourselves on cr chronic disease management. Uh, and now, uh, I was just elected to the National Alzheimer's Association Board, so we have a real emphasis now on Alzheimer's and dementia, um, which is a growing issue in the minority community. We also do sell, uh, uh, training and employment for low-income seniors. Uh, there are many seniors, obviously, who still want to work, but they have a real problem with ageism in terms of uh, competing for jobs. And so this is a program that's designed to help them to get trained in certain areas, and then we find placements for them. Uh, again, we serve in about 15 different states on that. We also work with the Environmental Protection Agency, who also hires seniors to work in various capacities. And so the senior employment outlook uh, is a lot of people want to still work. We call those encore careers. But uh, there are many, many seniors who have to work just to maintain any sort of life uh, or any kind of dignity of life as, as they get older. Uh, one of the things that we talked about, uh, particularly on our telephone call the other day, was uh, in terms of retirement and uh, looking into the future. And so um, that's a big issue for us because as we uh, look at all the statistics moving forward, uh, because of health issues, because of uh, just the employment opportunities, uh, we're very concerned about uh, there being enough money uh, not just for poor people, but for everybody. Uh, what we're finding is, is that most people have taken care of their families all of their lives. They've pretty much been under the radar. Uh, they've been able to pay their rent, put food on the table, and in some cases send their children to college. Uh, as they get older, either they're laid off or a health issue occurs, uh, and immediately they can find themselves in the poverty because we don't have pensions as we've known in the past. Uh, 401ks are unreliable, and of course, when you talk about savings, uh, on average, 
uh, most people uh, uh, don't have more than ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in savings. Obviously, that won't last if you live another twenty years after your uh, uh, career ends. So those are real concerns for us, and those should be concerns for you, because again, those of you who are very young, uh, this is a good time now to understand that uh, aging is not just old people. Aging is all of us, and if we're blessed with a long life, we have to prepare ourselves health-wise, financially, and as a society to care about our own side, because it's not a problem that's just with a minority community. It's not a problem that's just with a certain community. It is a problem for the American society to deal with when you start talking about there'll be more people over the age of 65 in 2060 than there'll be under 18. That's a statistic that's really important. And so when I ask the question about Pennsylvania and all the wonderful services that you all provide, and 80% of that is by lottery, that concerns me because our investment in how we create these services should certainly be something that's a part of your general fund because that's how important it is to our uh, community as a whole. So I'm not saying don't keep getting your lottery. I know you're doing well now. <laughs> I mean, if you're getting the money, that's great. But we all know that lotteries are progressive tax. And so I'm just concerned about that because uh, originally from Texas and of course a former state legislator. And I remember when the lottery was an issue in Texas and me and one other, two other people in the uh, assembly where we had 150 representatives voted against the lottery. And I remember I served under Ann Richards, and Ann came up to me and said, Karen, I can't believe you voted against the lottery. The people want it, and we need to give it to them. And I said, Governor, I totally understand that, but you're relying on poor people to take care of some very important things. And when they start talking about designating most of it to education, it's a very unreliable source of income, and so it was a concern to me. It's been popular, but let's remember, it's if we're talking about an investment into something that's very important in terms of the dignity and lives of our older people, we just want to make sure that eventually most of that, at least 50%, becomes a part of the general fund. So uh, that's my my speech to Pennsylvania, <laughs> but to other states too. Uh, and so the other part of what NCBA does and what I mostly do is I'm uh, an advocate on the Hill. I try to educate members uh, of, of Congress who particularly when they start looking at changing uh, any kind of benefits to Social Security or Medicare or any of the HUD funded programs that provide senior uh, subsidies for housing. Uh, I'm up to remind them of the growing need uh, in our communities on affordable housing. Uh, gentrification has changed our communities. Uh, just the need for affordable housing in all communities has changed. And some of them are kind of removed from it. So I kind of, I, I try to be the person that reminds them uh, that of the need of, of taking away funds from uh, looking at affordable housing. Uh, at changing the benefits of Medicare and certainly changing the age limit of Social Security and other benefits to go with that. A growing uh, population uh, more dependent on Social Security, which is not was never planned to be a retirement fund. We know that it's an insurance plan, but a growing number of people are depending on Social Security because it's their only form of income once they retire. So that's very important, and if we're not gonna invest in the early parts of people's years where they can have an opportunity to save and be able to have long-term uh, retirement or at least some sort of safety net as they get older, then we have to remind people that we'll have to make those adjustments accordingly, particularly when we know we're gonna have a growing aging population. So I'll just start off with, uh, stop with that. I welcome obviously questions and I wait for my fellow pal panelists to uh, speak to you and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Our second speaker is Tracy Groninger. Uh, Ms. Groninger is the 
district, excuse me, the directing attorney for Justice and Aging's economic security team based in also in Washington, D.C. Um, before that, she served as senior staff attorney for the Federal Trade Commission in its Bureau of Consumer Protection. Um, while at the Bureau of Consumer Protection, she specialized and litigated in cases to halt fraudulent and deceptive marketing practices, particularly in the area of fake Medicare schemes, um, government grants, phony business opportunities. Um, so please join me in welcoming Ms. Reniger. Thank you everyone for having me today. This is really exciting to hear. I'm learning things as I'm like sitting. It's really great. Um, I think this is a really important issue that we're talking about, aging. I mean, I work at Justice and Aging, so no surprise that I think this is important. Um, but talking about this is really helpful and it really brings up the areas that we need to be focusing on and the things that we need to be thinking about um, in terms of helping our older adult population to live in dignity as they age. Um, so I work at Justice and Aging, we're a national organization. We use law to advocate for the rights of older adults. And we are particularly focused on populations that historically have been unable to get full and fair access to the justice system. So people of color, immigrant communities, women, um, limited English proficient communities, immigrants, um, really thinking about how we can address the inequities that have, um, that have happened over the, over the years. Um, as Mary Kay mentioned, I came from Justice and Aging by way of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I worked there for 10 years, and working there, I really saw, as Karen mentioned, how a lot of things we try to segment, it's like us versus them, and you know, that's that issue affecting that population and there were a lot of stereotypes about older adults and about like who was being scammed and why they were being scammed and you know all those poor little old people who just can't protect themselves well the older adults were actually reporting a lot of fraud they were helping to identify scams that they were not the only people being targeted for so I did do some work on Medicare scams but I did work on business opportunity scams that older people were reporting but those scammers were hitting some very young people. They were looking for money. They're looking for vulnerabilities that all of us have. You know, people who lost their jobs. Um, one woman had lost her job. She had a child with a disability. And she was hoping that she could use this business opportunity to help her make some money. We heard about that through older adults, but this was a younger woman. So it wasn't something that only affected older adults. And I think there was a lot of misconception about who was being affected that didn't really serve a purpose other than creating an us versus them mentality that I think is not helpful. So I'm gonna agree with Karen that we think, we need to think about ourselves as a society and how we're helping everyone and we're all, it's all us. Um, so I ended up working at the FTC on an initiative that we called the Every Community Initiative and we reached out to populations that we didn't hear from regularly. So again, this is kind of that the groups of people that are not online reporting scams, um, including people of color and immigrant communities, and people of color in older adult communities as well. Um, I started reaching out and working with advocates to see what they were hearing and what they were seeing on the ground. Um, and I realized that that was a really interesting line of work and advocating on uh, issues that people were seeing on the ground was really interesting and I liked doing that. And I ended up at Justice in Aging. And there I primarily focus on economic security of older adults, primarily in the form of social security and supplemental security income. And people can ask questions, we can talk about that later. Um, we also do a lot of healthcare work. I don't do it personally, so I was furiously taking notes of very interesting <laughs> tidbits. Um, but we also do healthcare um, and think about things like Medicare and Medicaid and long-term services and supports and things like that. Um, but primarily in our area and in my uh, focus, we are looking at ways to support the economic security of older adults. And we work with organizations that do other kinds of advocacy, so housing advocacy or nutrition advocacy. We want to support all of those efforts to ensure that older adults do have general economic security. Um, but today, I want to talk about um, people of color, economic security, and women. I want to put in the women part because um, women make up almost two-thirds of the population of seniors in poverty. 
So when we're talking about poverty, we're talking about a lot of women. Um, and women of color especially are acutely affected because the things that are affecting all women are magnified um, in communities of color due to a lot of systemic inequities that we've seen just kind of building over time. Um, we see the intersectionality here for this discrimination that women face over the course of their lives and the discrimination that people of color face over the course of their lives. And so that makes for a higher rate of poverty among these communities. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three things today. I'm gonna give you a couple of statistics on um, women and people of color in poverty. I wanna talk a little bit about why um, these groups are more likely to experience poverty than others. Um, and then really quickly, some broad policies that might address the problem. Um, but we can talk more during questions and really dig into it a little bit more that way. So I wanted to start just by defining poverty so that we all are kind of on the same page um, according to the census. Uh, so 2018, I'm not giving 2019 yet because my stats are all based on 2018. Um, but for 2018, the income that a person over 65 had to make to be in poverty was $12,043 or lower. So about $1,000 a month. Um, there are a couple of different ways to look at using these figures, who is in poverty. Um, the census has two measures that they use. And one of them is the official measure, which is the one that you'll hear usually in the media or when people are talking very generally about like poverty statistics. But there's also a supplemental poverty measure. And Justice and Aging and some other people who are really studying these issues like the supplemental poverty measure better because it's a more accurate reflection of what people are actually facing. So the supplemental poverty measure, for instance, looks at things like where people live which we know has a big effect on whether or not you have enough money um, to meet your needs. Um, they look at things like whether or not you own your own home, the cost of um, out-of-pocket medical spending, which is a big one for older adults who have um, generally higher health care costs. Um, so that's the measure that I'm going to use for today. Um, another kind of important thing to think about when you're looking at economic security and poverty, is that we don't just want to think about who's in poverty and who's not in poverty, because technically not in poverty is not some magical, everything is, all, is great. You know, if you make $12,044, you're not like living high on the hog and things are really great for you. So I think that there are other ways that we can think about what we want for people in our society to have. Um, there's uh, something called the Elder Index, which looks at what people and what older adults would need in terms of income to meet their basic needs and be able to age in place and dignity. And I think that's a really important measure because that's what we're striving for. Like that's what we want. We don't wanna just have people like a dollar above poverty and now everything's great. We want people to be able to meet their needs, to be able to afford the medicine they need to live, the food that they need, the housing that they need, that's our goal. So I think that it's really good to keep in mind not just the measures of poverty, but the measures of what we're striving towards. So that said, now I'm gonna go back to the measures of poverty. But <laughs> if we look at the supplemental poverty measure, 15.6% of older women are living in poverty. And 12.2% of older men are living in poverty. So there's not a huge difference, but it's, there's a difference. If you look specifically at people of color, for black women, the poverty rate rises to 25.2%. Um, and for Latina women, the poverty rate jumps to 26.1%. So you see there's a big difference in terms of rates of poverty. In concrete numbers, that's about 4.2 million older women living in poverty and 2.7 million men. Um, that includes, and that includes about 2 million people of color, black and Latino people. So demographically, most of the older adult poor population is white, if you think about concrete numbers. And so the issue of senior poverty is not a black issue or a white issue, it's a seniors issue. Like we all need to be thinking about this in terms of we don't want our seniors living in poverty. But we also need to recognize that there is systemic discrimination and inequality that makes the rates of poverty different for different groups. And this to me highlights that we need to care about all of those issues and we need to tackle all of those issues so that we can address 
the historic discrimination and the senior poverty issue at the same time. We don't need to focus on just one and say, oh, well, we're just going to look at people of color and help them. You know, if we're helping people of color, if we're helping people who have faced discrimination over the course of their lives, we're also going to help the white people who have, who have poverty issues because of the way that our society is set up and because of some of the things that we've done writ large that have created the circumstances that have led to um, people not being able to meet their basic needs. So I'm going to move on to my second piece, which is why are people of color and older women more likely to live in poverty? And you can guess some of them, and Karen mentioned some of them, and I'm not going to go into all of them. I just kind of picked a couple of them because I think that it's important to have these discussions and talk about these issues, even though we kind of know some of what the problems are. I think that there is also a lot of misunderstanding, confusion, subtle systemic discrimination that becomes so embedded in the way that we think society should work that we don't necessarily think about them in a kind of concrete, solid way. And so talking about it and thinking about it and shining light on it, I think is really important to addressing problems and coming up with bold ideas and thinking about new ways to address the things that are big problems in our society. So a few of the drivers that I decided to talk about very, very briefly, uh, one of them is the wage gap and low paying work. So you've heard these statistics about women making approximately 80 cents for every dollar that a man makes. Women of color make even less than that. Um, this is not, and a lot of times people are like, oh, well, you know, women work less than men and they take time out of the workforce. First of all, there's an issue there to be discussed, but also it's not just that. That's like a sliver of why that why we have this wage gap. There's a lot of kind of systemic discrimination in terms of how we think about the value of women's work. So jobs that are predominantly held by women tend to be devalued. And so if it's a woman's profession, all of a sudden it's not worth as much money and it's not worth the same as if it is a man's profession. So that creates a problem right there. There's a lot of um, low wage work that is done by women. Um, I found a statistic that said that for jobs that pay $10 or less, seven in 10 of those workers are women. That's amazing. Low wage work, that's a woman's issue. That's a people of color issue. That's a societal issue. Low wage work. Like, let's think broadly about what the things are that we are perpetuating and creating systems for that then lead to people aging into adult poverty, older adult poverty, child poverty, it's all related. Um, so unsurprisingly, we have people who do not have enough money, who can't meet their needs because of this low wage work. And then there's another factor to add on to that, which is caregiving, which Karen mentioned, and I think you're gonna hear about that later as well. Um, women are the primary caregivers, not only of children, but also of adult relatives. This means they're more likely to take time off. They're more likely to take those lower paying, more flexible jobs. And when there's a hit, when you have to do the double, triple duty, like I have to have a job and I have to take care of my children, I have to take care of my parents, women are more likely to bear that brunt, which leads to health problems. So it's more you know, layer upon layer of issues that causes people to not be able to meet their own needs. Um, there's a lot of uncompensated value to caregiving, and I won't go into a ton of it, but I just want to mention that we don't spend enough in this country to meet the health care needs of the family and the care needs of families. And one way that we keep the official costs down is by shunting a lot of the work into informal caregiving so that women do this really important job and play this really important role in society, and then they're asked to just like accept that. Oh, and sorry, you don't have enough money to retire. Oh, sorry, you don't have any savings. Sorry that your health has gone down because you're doing all of these jobs. Well, that's just your duty. Hmm. Like, maybe we should think about, you know, what are we really saying as a society is important? What are we really asking women to do, caregivers to do? I don't want to 
say that men don't do caregiving, they also do. But what are we asking people to do and what is the effect that it's having? Um, one effect is that it does affect their social security benefits um, because those are based on income on wages. So for women who are taking time out of the workforce or taking these lower paying jobs, at the end of their kind of working, you know, when they hit retirement, their social security benefits are lower than people who did not have to do this, primarily men, but their income is lower from social security and their lifetime earnings have been reduced. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of like issues is the wealth and income gap. There's been a ton that has been written about that and I'm not gonna dig into like a lot of stats. I'm not gonna give you any stats. I'm not gonna give you any stats about wealth and income gaps. <gasps> Shock, I know, right? Like what? <laughs> I can't believe it. Like nobody's gonna listen if I do. Um, but the idea here is, you know, there's a wealth gap. There's wealth that's not being passed down in certain communities because they don't have it, which means that there are people who are not able to have this nest egg that they can depend on as they're aging. Um, and because people of color and women are earning less over the course of their lifetime, this income gap leads to a wealth gap. Um, and they don't have any very little retirement savings, overall savings, the equity in their homes are lower, um, and they're more likely to experience poverty. Married women, interest, not interestingly, I guess it's obvious, married women tend to do better than single women. Married people tend to do better than single people. But here's reality, is that most households are made up of single women. So we're not actually looking at the demographics of our society and what is reality for most people. Single women are leading households. They're the ones who have to kind of create the health, the dignity, the life for the family. And we're not taking that into consideration um, and we're not thinking about that. I did have one stat, but it's not about the wealth gap. This is a completely different one. So for women, as they get older, I thought about, you know, women who are, you know, single or who lose a spouse because of divorce or become, they become widows, you know, there are all of these things that happen over the course of a woman's life. But for people over 85, I found a stat about the percentage of men versus women over 85 who were married. So for men over 85, the figure was 54%, which I thought was kind of low, but I don't know. I don't really know statistics. I'm not a demographer. That was probably right. So men over 85, 54% are married. For women over 85, the number drops to 15%. So one five. So think about just the complete difference in terms of like an older person who has a spouse or someone available to help them as they age, a lot of women don't have that. And so it's just reality and we need to think about these kind of factors as we're thinking about how we address senior poverty, how we address economic security, and all of the things that we would like to see our society do for our older adult population and for our population in general. Uh, so the last thing I was going to talk about, and I'm going to end there, is um, some policy ideas and things that we could be thinking about. And I only have two right now. We could probably add more, um, but I wanted to just flag these two because I work in one of the areas and the other one I just thought was a good idea. Um, one is to expanding Social Security and updating our Supplemental Security Income Program. Um, as Karen mentioned, Social Security was not meant to be a retirement program, but de facto, like no one has money, people are depending on Social Security a lot as they age. And women make up over half of the people who are receiving Social Security benefits over age 62. Over a third of women, this is back to a stat, but more than 30% of women rely on Social Security for 80% or more of their income. So this is something that is not, oh, well, if I just want to have some spare spending money, I'll just use that Social Security. This is the basis of their income and their economic security as they age. And it only increases because of the fact that other assets can disappear. Pensions are going the way of like the dinosaur. Pensions are amazing. My dad has a pension and I'm like, what? They're just gonna pay you money forever? This is amazing. 
that's kind of gone. Like, I don't have a pension anymore. <laughs> it's not a thing. So we have to depend on our 401ks and our savings. Save now. Oh, this is a really good tip for the young people, that compounding interest. It's not as amazing as it was when there was really like great returns, but it still works and it's still a thing. So throw money into stuff now. Like if you have spare money, just throw it into like savings and you'll be so happy later when you look at your bank account. You're like, I have money, yay. I didn't do anything, yay. It just like comes out so quickly and easily. You don't have to worry about it. You don't wanna have to worry about it because it's a real issue. People don't contribute to their 401k because they don't understand like how to do it, how much to do. A lot of people don't have access to a 401k plan. Women who work part time often don't have access to a 401k plan. If you have access to a 401k plan, use your 401k plan early and often. Okay, that's my high horse that I will not come off of. Um, so social security is really important. We need to expand it to reflect the fact that people are using it as their primary source of income and this is at the end of their working years so you can't tell people to go back go back and put money in your 401k that's not going to work for someone who's 70 years old that's not realistic so we need to think about that um, another thing we could do is provide caregiving credits and i guess this is still related to social security but actually providing some kind of benefit or compensation to people who have taken time out of work and who are not being otherwise compensated, giving them credit for that so that their social security benefits are not reduced because of that time that they spent um, caring for adult parents or for children. Um, and it can be a progressive thing, so it's not necessarily something that everyone would receive, but it could be something that makes the difference between living in poverty and not, and having economic security when you reach old age. So I'm going to end by saying that um, Justice and Aging just recently did a paper on women in poverty. So go on our website and take a look. It has a lot more ideas and has um, more discussion of these kinds of issues. Um, Kaiser Family Health also recently put out a paper on older adults in poverty um, that you can find online. So if you're interested in that, you can take a look there. Um, and feel free to talk to me after, and we can have more discussion. But this has been really um, interesting and educational, so I would love to hear. I'm excited to hear everyone else. Thanks. Our last speaker before we open the floor up to discussion is Mame Jumphy. Um, Ms. Jumphy is senior attorney with the ARP Foundation and a healthcare expert. Um, before she became senior attorney with ARP, she worked as this, a senior counsel at the Office of the Inspector General in the Department of Health and Human Services, where she worked especially on health care fraud and compliance issues. Um, today, she works on broader issues, um, including health law, civil rights, elder abuse, and disability rights. Um, please join me in welcoming Ms. Jumpy. to be using this PowerPoint, so let's see how this goes. Okay, hello everybody. And yes, my name is Mommy Jumpy. Mommy is my first name. It's not that popular in the United States, but if you go to Dr. Google, you'll see that it's extremely popular in Ghana, where my family originally comes from. So where I work is the AARP Foundation. So you know how everyone knows about AARP, a membership organization for people age 50 plus? Well, AARP has a charitable arm, which is the AARP Foundation. Our focus is on low income seniors. We basically fight senior poverty. And where I specifically work in is the litigation office. So a lot of the things that you've heard this morning, you've heard about statistics, you've heard about different um, really good programs, right? Um, which is fantastic. And a lot of people who are in the law enforcement world, you know how we talk about the carrot and the stick? So I don't do policies like that, and I don't do programs. When, you, when I hear anyone saying anything, all I think in my head is who can I sue? Who can I sue? Who can I sue? So for those of you that are out there, right, you know how, like, you know, one of the wonderful things about these various professions is you can use various degrees for a million different things. And so anyone here who is in law school who's thinking like, what do I want to do with my law degree and what I'm seeing in this class and that class, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a litigator 
you can do policy. You can do I mean, a variety of different things. You can do you know, work in the government. You can you know, oversee a whole bunch of components. You don't have to do just litigation. But if there's a part of you that when you hear something, the first thing you think is, who can I sue? I encourage you go to go into advocacy and enforcement because you'll be thrilled. <laughs> so in any case, here I describe a little bit about what we actually do in my office. So we actually work nationwide and we fight for the legal rights and interests of older adults. And we do what we call impact litigation. So it's not necessarily that we do a, a case on behalf of an individual, unless by doing that case on behalf of an individual, we can do like nationwide change and make change for older adults. So mostly we do cases like class action type cases, but we do again do cases for individual, but it would be a situation where even though we were representing the individual, it was against, let's say, a nationwide nursing facility chain or a nationwide thing. So as part of our results, we're not just getting necessarily damages, but we might get an injunction that forces change for the corporation or forces change for the, whatever we're suing. So that way you don't just get money, but you also get change that basically impacts everybody. Um, and again, in terms of low income older adults or older adults period, um, we're not specifically focused on any specific group. We're for helping older adults. However, when we are approached with a situation or when we're looking at research that shows that older adults, let's say in, rural, in a specific rural area, are having problems getting access to certain benefits, then we will go and litigate on their behalf. And obviously when we have, uh, we realize issues with diverse old elders where they're having specific issues, we also litigate on our, our behalf. So we specifically, our, our point is where we see a legal barrier, where we see injustice, we are like, we consider ourselves, our duty, our purpose is to go in there and help. You know, I, I like to tell people, look to see who, who was missing. So when people go to nursing facilities, right? You go to a nursing facility, you might be visiting someone in a nursing facility, and people will come back later on and say, oh, there were all these people that were just you know, pushed in a chair and they were looking out the window, pushed in the chair against the wall, right? Now, some people actually have said when they enter or their family member might say, hey, this person loves the sun, so let's try and make sure that they are back. But if you see someone just sitting there all day long, one of the things that I've noticed is that there are people who don't have anybody and they don't have anyone to speak up for them. Um, these people, I, I consider like this a harsh term, but like people who are invisible, right? And so when you see something that's missing um, see, and they don't have a voice, that's when an opportunity for you to give them a voice and to make sure that they're living a life of dignity um, is one thing. So if there's only one slide here that you remember from anything that I say today, this is my boom shakalaka slide, <laughs> which is that the future favors the bold. So focus on doing your part with zeal. And I always have this slide because I think sometimes when you go to a conference like this or a meeting like this and people start throwing out statistics and this and that, it either gets so overwhelming that you're like, well, how do people really address these issues? Even though you're hearing about programs that are successful, it still gets overwhelming. Or you get to the point where you're like, oh, well, that's not really my deal. And I, that's nice that I heard about that, but let me go back to my regular life, right? And so I always encourage people that number one, if you're someone who wants to address these issues, um, I used to get frustrated as a prosecutor because you would, like I was doing like white collar fraud, right? And so I was doing going against people who engaged in Medicaid, Medicare fraud, and they do the fraud, we'd find them, and then literally like two years later, the same people who were doing that fraud had now had a new company and they were doing the same kind of fraud. So they, people use the term a lot of times whack-a-mole and so I would get really frustrated, like, well, you know, I wanted more criminal convictions and I wanted more this and more that to try and get these people to stop doing this. Um, and one of the things that my supervisor at the time said was that, you know, you get frustrated because you want to take care of everything at once. But if you can find your piece and your part and do your piece and your part with zeal, right, you will at least doing something to help the situation. And I found somewhat peace in, in making sure that I do my part but I do it with zeal. So I encourage everybody to do that. And so sometimes, if this is even like not your issue, if that minimum, if you're going to a place, let's say a nursing facility, and you notice that someone seems to be sitting there with drool on them and no one's wiping them up or anything, even just making a simple comment to someone saying, hey, can you clean that person up? You know, going by someone's room and it smells really bad. Like there's something smelling bad in that, that little part. If you just even do, if that's all you do, if that's the only thing you do with zeal, 
then do that. If, you know, if you're a person who con calls your representatives and all you do is say, well, you know what, once a year, I'm making a list of everything I'm mad at and I'm calling the person, I'm saying all this stuff, do that. But whatever you do, do your part with zeal. We're talking now about racial disparities. When we look at racial disparities, um, first of all, on the foundation, there's two kind of big ways that we focus on looking at things. One are ways that we can get older adults to be able to age in place. And second are ways that we can help them continue to be socially connected. And one thing that you're gonna be hearing more and more of, and I think actually they've been talking about now for about five years, is social connectedness and how that affects getting older. Um, and so you'll see lots of reports on loneliness, but you'll also see different ways and different products and programs to got, try and get people more socially connected. Um, again, going back to the nursing facility situation. Being in the nursing facility itself is being socially not connected. So that kind of gives you an example of how social connectedness works. And then people who are lucky enough to have people visit them, that's so critical because when the people who don't have anyone coming, that's when they're completely socially disconnected, but also too, when they're at their most vulnerable for potential abuse and neglect. Um, and again, I wanna make sure, I don't think all nursing facilities are horrible, dot, 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 but I just wanna focus on, I focus again on the who can I sue. So I, I focus on the dire straight issues I hear about and how do I address them. Um, I also wanna talk about how I'm speaking today about behalf of my litigation office, but the AARP itself has so many different programs addressing the issues that we've been talking about today. And in addition, most recently, they have launched this AARP Disrupt Disparities Program, where they're gonna take it nationwide, but they're going to each state and working on specific programs and um, talking with people in the actual groups within the state to try and figure up different policy proposals, legislative proposals that they can have to disrupt any kind of racial disparities for people as they get older. So I just wanted to mention that they've already started in New York and Michigan. And if you go to the AARP website, you'll see um, a lot of information about that. So in talking about nursing facility disparities, um, of course, the nursing facilities have a disproportionate proportionate number of African American and Hispanics living in nursing facilities, okay? And then when they have all these people who have done studies on them, and what you'll find is um, the kind of quality of care um, the quality of care, the number of staffing um, really differs depending upon whether it's in a more low income place and also depending upon how many of the nursing facility residents are residents of color. And so one of the things when we talk about well, how do we get our cases, we get our cases from a variety of sources. We get our cases from research, from a, let's say a new, inf new information will come about an issue. Um, we try again, like I said, to look at people who are considered invisible and try and address things for them. We get it from our partners. We work with Justice and Aging on quite a few of our cases. Um, but we also mostly get them from you. So at the end slide, I'll have a place where you guys can call or email to give us information because they get a lot from you. And so one of the things in terms of our nursing facility work, um, there's a couple of things that people have told us about where we've pursued cases. One is people who are living in their homes. They do not wanna go to a nursing facility but because of some kind of change, generally in Medicaid or in the amount of home care they can get, um, now they might be facing a situation in which they're having to move into a nursing facility. Um, so there's various rules that we use, um, which is one is the Olmstead mandate to try and ensure that um, the states are doing whatever they can to help the people remain in their homes. If again, it's possible to be, for them to be able to be in their home, um, we, they try and put them in the most integrated um, setting possible for their needs. Um, the other thing is also using something like Olmstead, which is also the American with Disabilities Act, to be able to return people to the community. So one of the things when we were talking about how do we get our cases, um, we got some calls from some people who were saying like, you know, I've been in this nursing facility. I first came because I broke my leg, um, but I, they were in DC. And they were like, I'm, but I've been in this facility now for three years. And I'm not sure like how I'm supposed to get out. And the problem was that they were having problems transitioning from the facility back to a home. And some of the people had family members who were willing to take them in. Other people had lost their apartments because they were in the facility for so long. And so they didn't really have a place to go. And so they wanted help in terms of finding a place to go. But that's an area where we also step in. Um, I brought up the section 1557 of the ACA because I think that 
um, one of the things that um, was not done well in terms of the messaging and communication of the Affordable Care Act is the Affordable Care Act actually has a whole slew of things in it that people don't even know because people are so like focused on the health insurance specific side. And one of the best things that the Affordable Care Act has is section 1557, which actually prohibits discrimination against on the basis of age, race, um, disability, sex, dot, 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 in the provision of healthcare services. So you know how earlier when people were talking about disparities with regard to healthcare services, and I told you like, I'm like, okay, well then who can we sue? Who can we sue? How can we sue? Well, this is a tool to be used to address some of those disparities. So, and it gives you a private right of action to be able to address those disparities. So I just bring that up again. Um, and then also looking at different things for prevent abuse and neglect of residents. So let me give you an example of a specific case that we had. And this is the ending of the use of chemical restraints in nursing facilities. Now I'm not sure if everybody knows what a chemical restraint is. Um, my understanding is that back in the day, whatever that means, people used to actually forcibly um, restrain people to, in the residents and nursing facilities to their bed using whatever rope or using something kind of restraining device. And that became like illegal, okay. So then instead what some places are doing um, that are illegal is that instead they're using chemicals to have the same effect, okay. And the Human Rights Watch last year um, did a study where they found that about 180 residents per week were being given um, what we call being given antipsychotic drugs in particular with no medical justification and often with no informed consent. So you know how we're talking about tools that you can use. One of the tools you can use is to make sure that you have designated someone to be your legal decision maker if you lack capacity or you're no longer to make decisions for yourself. Um, um, but again, some people just don't have somebody, but um, in terms of this, one of the things that's going on was that the nursing facilities um, that were doing engaging in this conduct were providing, again, drugs like Zaprexa to people for staff convenience. So one of our cases, the person was yelling, okay? So the person got into the nursing facility and within 24 hours started yelling. And they were brought there because they had an impaction. So instead of the facility actually doing investigation to see why they were yelling. Um, they immediately were like, okay, you know what, that noise is driving me crazy, right? And this facility happened to be one that actually wrote down, that noise is driving me crazy, yelling, right? You know, Zaprexa, and then started basically giving the person um, Zaprexa. Um, now, the reason why I bring this into the racial disparities discussion is because um, a lot of the facilities that we find that people are doing that are facilities with re predominantly residents of color, okay? I also bring it up because with regard to the antipsychotic drugs, um, the FDA requires a black box warning that for older adults with dementia, there's an increased risk of death. And then if you go back to, I believe um, Karen had mentioned the whole Alzheimer connection and the disproportionate representation of African Americans and Hispanics and Alzheimer's, so you can appreciate why this is particularly um, devastating. Um, to elders of color, so I bring that up as well. And again, this is something where when we sue the um, facilities, we pick nationwide facilities with the hope that's part of our resolution. We say that they actually have to number one, train, number two, um, get the um, informed consent before they give a drug and make sure that if they're giving any drug, even an antipsychotic drug, that they do it with medical justification. So that's kind of one of the things. now. Um, Trace talked a lot about economic security, so I'm not going to talk so much about that. But again, going back to the um, who can you sue, right? One of the things that we look at are what are the legal barriers to income. And so we would approach something in that way. We also look at, you know, when we talked earlier about consumer fraud, I as well had spent time in the Federal Trade Commission. So, you know, consumer fraud, consumer protection is a very big issue. and. Um, there's almost like a, first of all, because some people have loneliness, when we talked about loneliness before, one of the most devastating parts is they'll have these people, these fraudsters who will call up um, older adults, right? 
and some of them might be a little bit lonely. So first of all, everyone gets fraud defrauded, okay? I'm telling you, like we used to have those, those things that they say like take a pill and lose like 50 pounds in one week, right? And then we get the list, when, we, when we're doing the case, we get the list of people who actually bought this pill, right? And you had everything from every profession, every age, everything. So let's not pretend that only certain groups um, get it. And that's why back in the day, and they, I don't know if they have it as much now, they used to have all these like late night TV infomercials to trick people into all of this stuff, right? Okay, so everyone kind of gets it. But one of the things that we saw consistently, I've seen this both when I'm in ARP, but also when I was FTC, was that with some of the people they would say, well, you know what, um, like when they would call and complain about it, and we'd call them back and say, hey, we realize that you're, they would say, was well, that person gonna stop calling me? Because it was a form, it was like a relationship. I mean, it was a sick relationship, but it was a relationship because someone was calling them. So, you know, I mean, that is just something that, you know, you have to think about when you talk about consumer fraud. Other times, people just simply don't know. So the cases that we also have where someone's being charged a higher interest rate because they're being deemed a higher risk because of their age, because of their race, because of their gender, they actually have no idea that their interest rate is higher. You know, and one of the people I was opposing was like, well, you know what, that's just because they're the part of the sucker class. But it's not really the sucker class. They actually don't know that they got charged a higher rate because no one can actually show them that. Um, age discrimination in employment. Obviously, when people have the layoffs, right, who are they laying off? Um, when people ha are not hiring, who are they not hiring? So those are the kind of issues we also fight. And then one more thing I just wanted to mention on the economic security is the pension um, abuse. So um, when you were talking earlier about how there's less and less pensions, right? But the other thing that's happening with some pensions especially like the state government pensions, but also pensions for different organizations, is that they now are like renegotiating or saying that, oh, because of budgetary issues, you no longer can get that exact pension. Sometimes if it's a state, it might actually go through the legislature where they actually say like, you know, hey, we have to protect our state. And so therefore we can't really agree to that. Now, the reason why that affects this population um, in a different way is because number one, for a lot of people, when they were getting jobs as part of life and history and integration and all of that, people were getting government jobs. And I remember like when I was growing up, they used to tell us like, get you a good government job, right? And so people would say like, and with benefits, right? It's like, because that's how you got benefits, right? And so, so when you see people, and, I mean, and that's what they, people would say. Like and everybody would say, like, ooh, he got a good government job. He got benefits and he was a good man because woohoo, right? So I mean, that's just something that people thought, you know? And so they finish, the people work this job, right? And because they work that job, a lot of times they might have gotten less of a salary in terms of take home, but they had the benefits, okay? And they relied on that contract saying that, hey, when I retire, I'm now gonna get the benefits, only to find out that now that they're retired, someone's trying to renegotiate their pension. So we do cases on behalf of older adults, right, who have retired who are now having their pension renegotiated. Um, we, I, I have to mention this. One person, though, one of the cases we did, um, she was about to retire, okay? And like, you know, we talk about people have views of people. And so people were saying to her, um, and when she was taking the deposition, well, why don't you just work a few years longer? Well, she was a 911 dispatcher. So she had this really great answer where she said, well, you know, let me tell you what happened yesterday. Yesterday morning when I came in, within 15 minutes, I helped the person, like I helped, you know, I don't know, an 18 year old um, help their um, girlfriend give birth because like, I guess she was in the room and she started giving birth. That I got a call two hours later where three people had been shot and I was helping the phone. She kind of listed what her day was like and she was like, I can barely make it to next week, let alone you telling me I need to do this job for three more years. And I think that sometimes, too, I always try and bring the people into the room because, of course, when you're talking about statistics, and you need to talk about statistics, okay, because the reality is because people, um, you know how people are on the continuum and some people don't believe anything until you show them data, right? So, like, you hear people, like, like you say, like, oh, this is, this is horrible is happening. They go, like, eh, whatever. It's horrible for everybody. We don't care. And then also you say, but it's happening here. And here's some data that's done by a study and it was double blind. And then they're like, woo! okay, I believe it, yeah, right? And so like, you know, some people are those like seeing is believing and touching and you know, people, right? So because once you show them data and um, they say like, oh, this is, I, I see this as a problem. So, you know, because of that, there's some data that has, shows and supports 
a lot of these things. And in fact, when we go to court, um, on a side note, as a practitioner, you have to do that too. You'll have a case that you will think, I mean, sometimes when we have some of these cases, some of the cases that we've lost, right, if I told you the case and showed you, like, how did you lose that case? But like the judge would be like, okay, no, I just don't believe that, right? And so we try and bring everybody in the room. And one of the people that we bring into the room are people that bring in data. Like when they talk about cases, they say, like, well, we do they have the experts and the battle of the experts? All that is because people are, it's not enough to just say this happened to me. People want to actually have something else they can hold to make sure they really believe it. Um, the other thing I just want to talk a little bit about the reverse mortgage litigation. Um, I don't really have to talk about too much of it, but I just want to say that's an area that also has been like really rampant with fraud. It seems to make absolute sense because you think about it, what a reverse mortgage basically is, is a person who's 62 or older is able to borrow if they're lucky enough to have a home against their home equity in a legal arrangement. So they basically get to tap cash for during their retirement. So it sounds like a really reasonable answer. And I do wanna say, for some people, it absolutely works. So I always like, wanna be careful of like overgeneralizing on anything. However, where you're engaged with someone who's a fraudster, right? What you will quickly find is you will see, and again, we go after systemic, so we don't go after necessarily one person, but systemic, where they are systemically um, claiming that the person did some kind of error and therefore putting their house up for foreclosure. Um, and so we've had at least three different times with cases where we've had this situation, where we've had to come in against some of the larger um, companies and either sue or once we start like talking to them, they realize that it's not gonna go well for them and they change their ways. So that's just something that um, we look at. Um, housing, I just wanna mention because every time I meet with any group and I say, well, you know, tell me the issues that you're concerned about, everyone always tells me affordable housing. So that to me is just something that, you know, people talk a lot about the income and the money and the save the money and the this and the that. But I think that the ability to be able to rest your head somewhere is something that people don't really talk about as much, but is a big issue. And one of the things that we deal with and we see a lot are landlords trying to kick the older adult out. Um, sometimes what they'll say is, oh, that person is too frail to live independently, even though the state is having giving fantastic home and community-based services and they're actually thriving. Um, they have that, and so we basically chase them with the American with Disabilities Act and also the Fair Housing Act. We also have situations where, um, we were talking earlier about gentrification. In the past two years, we've been seeing more cases around that in terms of trying to figure out different ways of attacking these things. And I just wanna say, a lot of times, the issues that we're dealing with, they don't have a nice statute that you point to. That's one reason why I like the 1557 with regard to the health disparities because that's the one time where you have a statute you can point to. But they don't have a nice statute that you can point to and say, hey, the, the conduct that you did goes under this. I mean, sometimes it does, but sometimes we have to kind of be creative-ish. So when I talked earlier about the chemical restraints, we pursue those because unfortunately the people pass away because of the drug, right? So we pursue those under wrongful death but we also pursue those under medical battery. And if you guys remember what the battery is, so we're saying it's a medical battery every time they give an injection. So sometimes we have to find creative ways of addressing things. And then sometimes the law is just there for us. So in terms of the Fair Housing Act, the racial disparity and disability and discrimination, racial discrimination is right there in the Fair Housing Act. So we can just go ahead and use that. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up because of the aging in place was transportation and other type access issues. So also too, um, you have situations where they might have fantastic um, transportation and access for people um, for people who are either like in, in their homes they can't be able to get, they can't get to their medical appointments, or they'll have a situation where um, those people just don't have good access or transportation period for wherever they live. They might be in a very rural area or whatever. So first of all, going back to the program and carrot side, they have a lot of fantastic programs that are out there for people to try and um, people to try to connect to be able to get into the community and not have to stay in their homes if they're able to like mobile, be mobile and move. So one thing I like is that I think again, sometimes if people go to Dr. Google or I guess research assistant Google, um, one of the problems, a lot of people, they have programs, but they don't even know the programs exist. So they can't connect to the program. So it's almost like you wanna have a bridge to the programs. And again, ARP has some good information. ARP Foundation has some good information. 
the organizations that these two ladies are from have good information. So like take advantage and tell people to take advantage of the information that's out there because there are states, counties that actually do have these kind of programs, okay? But in addition though, for those places that don't and someone is just like, you know, isolated and has problems with transportation, um, you know, that's something that we look at as well to see if there is someone who's supposed to be providing transportation and is not. So that, I just use transportation as an example, but there are a variety of different things that might go underneath that umbrella. So in any case, I ask you to definitely um, send us any information that you might have. And it's funny, now that you spoke right, about how it's not others, it's all you. I'm gonna change this slide to help us help you so that people can understand that we're all in this together. And um, again, here's the information to please contact us with any referrals. So thank you very much. Thank you all for those remarks. Um, I think that they really fit together in terms of bringing up so many of the um, so many of the different issues that are confronted. And I guess I'd like to start opening um, things up to questions, but picking up on your theme about doing your piece and your part. Um, a number of the people in the audience today are law students, um, and so if you could each um, offer. Um, maybe a few comments on how students who want to get involved doing legal work, whether it's advocacy or whether it's policy, et cetera, but in this area, might get started. Um, I think that would be enormously useful to our, to our audience. Well, I guess it's a big question, so I'll, I'll, I'll start wherever. Just a le I'm, I was a legislator. I made law, do people, <laughs> but I didn't do it was like. <laughs> do people need to get up to use the mics, or can they sit at their seats to, for the conversation? How, how does this work? Okay. Is there your mics there? Okay, great. Okay. I would say one option is looking for fellowship. Um, there are a lot. Oh, that turned on. There are a lot of fellowship opportunities that um, for justice and aging. We usually in the summers hire fellows who get funding through either their law school has like partial funding or also um, things like. Trying to think of some of our most recent um, foundation. Borchard gives a, a grant for people to work during the summer. Um, I want to say Equal Justice Works does one too okay. as well. Um, but if you look up different fellowships, and they're relatively open-ended, I would say, in terms of allowing people to create a project of interest to them. So for us, when we have law students who are interested in working, for example, at Justice and Aging, we'll find out you know, what are your interests, what are the things that you're looking to um, work on, and then they create a project based on that. And it usually, it has to kind of jive with what we do in our you know, everyday work, but there's a lot of flexibility and creativity there. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to be in that space Usually our fellows go with us when we do various meetings, when we go to the Hill, if we're working in a coalition, and they kind of get a sense of just who, who the players are and kind of how the day-to-day -day work goes. And I think that's a really great way to find out what you want to do and really focus in if you already have an idea of your passions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to um, echo what she said. I think that looking for any kind of fellowship, internship in the areas is important, um, and you can find them. And I know like AARP Foundation, litigation office, my office, we have both summer interns as well as when people graduate, we have a fellowship. Um, and part of our fellowship and the, in, as, and the summer work is we, they actually do everything that we do. So like they're gonna be in there with us when we prepare, helping us prepare for depositions, helping us you know, doing a lot of research and memo writing, helping us when we go into court, we bring them into court with us. So like we, again, we are like a, we're a rocket docket, if you will, in terms of our litigation. So we have them hand in hand with us for everything that we do. And these are paid too, the ones yes. that I'm talking about. These are not free work. Right. I know that that's a thing. But, <laughs> but, I, but I also want to add one more thing, though, because um, I was thinking of Karen. Also, in terms of being able to get a legislative job, right, or a legislative internship on any of these areas, right, whether it be with a committee that does it, whether it be with a specific representative that has a particular interest, I find that that is some of the absolute best ways, right? In addition, if there are specific offices, like the, the earlier today we heard from the Department of Aging, right, 
absolutely go and work in the Department of Aging too, and you will learn from like the best of the best, but you also will learn from the people, which I always like, the people who are actually at the cutting edge of what's actually happening. Because sometimes we have dreams as to what is really going on, but when you see the people go in and out and actually do it, it gives you a good stronghold and foundation for how to do this work. <laughs> That's great. Okay, there you go, our students. All right, let's um, let's open the floor up to uh, to questions from from anybody. Lori. Hmm. Well, a couple of things. So the question, I, th I think everyone might have heard, but the question was in terms of people who are basically victims, if you will, of consumer fraud, if they don't know that they're a victim of consumer fraud, how do they learn about this? So a, a bunch of different ways. So first of all, for our specific cases, part of what we get as part of our case is to get a list of the consumers mm -hmm. who purchase the product or purchase the situation, right? So part of the resolution, we generally try and get an injunction in which we or the company will have to contact the people and let them know that they were they were mistreated or how whatever the legal conduct was to try and get some kind of retribution, right? But then in addition, again, one of the main points of our organization is to raise awareness. So then we will also do a consumer education campaign to try and raise awareness, and then we'll use all these different partnerships we have to communicate that idea as well. The reality is that there's some people who just don't know. There's some people who are probably sitting in this room right now who have some like mortgage rate, or they're just like when you go when you go to get like your car fixed, right? And not everyone is getting the same price, right? And so some people just don't know, um, and they won't know. But we try and do the best that we can um, to do consumer education and awareness, both by ourselves and through our partners, and to also have that part of any resolution that we have on a case. And related to my time from the FTC, because I can't help it, um, one of the big things is just being aware of the fact that, you know, that scams are out there and doing due diligence. So a lot of times people don't think that they can be scammed, and so they don't have kind of those sort of like, you know, eyes up to see the scams that are in front of them. And we actually had a program before I left that was using some of the, um, the older adults who were more likely to report and be engaged with us because they just were interested in that, creating a campaign that actually had them doing some of the outreach and consumer education because they were listening. Because really you want people to be in listening mode when you're doing the consumer education because you can tell people as much as you want, but if they're not taking it in, it's not going to make a difference. And finding trusted people in communities who were giving the messages about watching out for particular types of scams and how you do that was much more effective in a lot of ways than just throwing out you know, brochures and pamphlets of the different kinds of scams that were out there that people weren't necessarily taking in because they thought, that's not me, that's somebody else. And so awareness is a huge factor. So uh, <clears> the <throat> only thing I want to add to that is, is that we're now living in a time when the consumer, um, uh, I forgot, the consumer um, education. The, you know, the whole the division that right. was created in the last few years. Uh, the consumer, yeah, yeah, consumer, consumer Financial, financial Protection Bureau, Bureau. Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Created in last year to try to prevent and educate and to advocate mm -hmm. on behalf of that is being zeroed out every time a budget is submitted. Mm -hmm. Now, why don't we want Americans to know about whether they're being scammed or not? It just doesn't make any sense. So uh, it, those of you who have the great legal minds who will be working in these issues, it's important for you to understand and why we have to support making sure that here you have an organization based on trying to do just that, that they zero out every year. Yeah. Other, any other questions? Yes.
That's a good question. I mean, I think that part of the problem with pensions, and I don't work in pensions, is just the incentives to businesses and the, in the way that it was set up that has become so unpopular now. I mean, the people who created the 401k, I can't remember who they were, but they basically were like, wow, we didn't mean to do this, guys, sorry. Well, it was. Yeah, and I mean, there are advocates who work specifically right. on pensions, and maybe that's what they're doing right now. Um, for us, we have really focused, we've turned our focus more on kind of the, not the back end, but the social security piece because it's there and it's it, it exists and it's something that we could create policy and we can really like pinpoint, like if we do these few things, we can really expand the amount of benefits and we really can bring a lot of people up in terms of their economic security. And it already boosts a lot of people out of poverty. And so for our specific organizations, that's where we focus. I don't disagree with you, and I wouldn't be against that kind of angle. It's just not where we focus. Well, you, you go ahead, Mama. Well, I was going to say, well, obviously, AARP does promote pensions. And obviously, like I said, part of what we do is that when we see people um, not getting what they were promised from their pension, then we litigate. So. Well, and we've educated people now to say uh, um, that, you know, well, pensions are going away. So nobody's even thinking about, well, I can get a pension from my employer. So we don't, the pressure is not on corporations and other organizations to even provide them. So if they don't have to provide it, and there's no pressure from us to say, hey, if I give you 30 years of my life and I've helped the wealth of this uh, organization or this, this corporation make it. It seems to me for the next 20 years, you ought to try to give me a little something for what I've invested into making this business. We've, we've gotten away from that. We don't, we've, we've gotten away from caring about how much employees give to organizations and corporations. We've gotten away from that. There's no, uh, except for a few. I mean, Warren Buffett, <laughs> he believes if you work with me a long time, at the end, when you leave us, we're going to make sure that for the rest of your life, you have some sort of stable income. There are just very few employers that don't have that kind of feeling anymore, and they, and they got the out when we created 401ks. Can I just add one quick thing about that? Also, too, I think that there is a big effect from, as they call it, the Great Recession, that people don't necessarily, now that we're like, I don't know, 10 years, whatever, out, remember, right? And there was a point where people were like, like all this, like people were lucky to have a job. So all of this like underemployment and, and some people who lost jobs never were able to gain them back again, right? So there was a desperation around that, right? Where people would say, people weren't saying like, well, you know, what's my pension? People were like, I need a job, you know? And, and, and people were saying, and, and people were getting underemployed. All that stuff was happening. But if you had a job, you were thrilled. So, I mean, I think that that also had a lasting impact where people kept that mindset and you know, don't know that there's another world out there. And one more thing I would add is there's been this growth, which is like a danger, this growth of the gig economy, which is like the exact opposite of all of this discussion. And I think that a lot of policymakers and people who are thinking about like the future of workers and society are worried about the gig economy. Like they're scared. Like I know I have these like, oh my God, there's so many people who have no like social security, I'm sure, because they're not, nothing's being counted and they're doing these like one-off jobs, so there's no pension there because there's no feeling of like, you're not an employee, you're just an employee, but you're not. And so there's this huge danger of what's gonna happen over the course of time as people in this gig economy are realizing that they don't have like job security, they don't have savings because they're not usually making a ton of money, and there's a lot of danger there. And so I don't know exactly where that all is going to lead. Yeah, and I got to jump on that a little bit just because I love the gig economy because to me the gig economy gets people to have extra jobs when people are concerned about how much money they're going to have. You know, it might just be like my background, but I'm like, yeah, you know, I got to be for a job. Yeah, I keep on, you know, so I understand the part that they're not necessarily having the benefits and other things right. But the idea that someone can supplement their income with something that they know how to do, whatever it is, right, and 
I, I think it's fantastic. I wish that it was more fair. So where I would put the litigation is to make sure we protect the people who do it, to be able to maximize what they can get out of it and make sure they gain a fair day's income for a fair day's pay. But in terms of the existence of the gig economy, I love it. I have this prediction that the gig economy is going to change. Maybe it's just a hope. As yeah. people kind of realize what amount of money they actually are making and the cost of those jobs, because you read sometimes about people who are like an Uber driver and they spent the entire day working and they made six dollars mm -hmm. you know and things like that like are is that going to create a relationship where people then do say I'm not doing this unless you give me X because we start to realize you know what some of the inequities and injustices are I do use the gig economy it's not like you so know. just one more thing the advocates for pensions are there there are a lot of people who do it but and I think with your legislators you just have to, we have to require that when they start giving tax breaks to corporations and when they start giving them all the benefits uh, for them to continue with their profit and to only look to shareholders rather than looking at the overall community, that we ought to put in there that what, what are you doing for your employees? Uh, do you have a pension? Is there, some, you know, we ought to do more requirement than just giving them a tax break thinking that they're going to bring all these millions of jobs into a community and that that's their investment. Um, you know, there are just ways that, w that our legislators ought to do differently too. We had a question. We have time for one more question. Yes. <laughs> so in terms so thank you for your question. The question was, how do we, and remember, I just want to make sure I make it clear. I work at ARP Foundation Litigation Office, but how do we make it reach out to people so people can know that we actually exist and that we're a resource for them? And what we do is we do a, quite a few things. Number one, we partner with a lot of organizations, both um, that national organizations, but also organizations in the community in terms of sharing our information. We send our attorneys out and make speeches and we also find people in the community who might have the similar issue to be part of the presentation so they can kind of share information that way, right? So, and then we, um, we partner a lot with like the consumer voice in terms of like age discrimination employment. We partner a lot with the national organizations um, in terms of diverse elder coalitions. We talk, talk, talk to them. So we really do it through our partnerships. I mean, of course we have things on the internet like everyone else does, but in terms of really getting the information to where we can meet the people, we always say like we try to go as far as someone who's going to either we can talk to the person ourselves or someone else who's going to be standing next to the person. So we um, make it a point to go real local. They could do a better job because they're the gorilla in the room. AARP is. 
And so, and when I say that, I mean they are really the most recognized aging organization in the country with their nine trillion mm -hmm. members or what have you. And 38 million. <laughs> no, they, no. And you know, we only think of it sometimes as just where you can get a discount if you're a senior mm -hmm. or what have you. But in reality, <laughs> they are truly the gorilla in the room and they can make a difference so much so on so many policy and legislative issues. And so um, they couldn't do a better job within the minority community, which is, I know they've, they've tried different aspects or what have you, mm -hmm. but I always tell them all the time, because we partner with them sometimes on certain issues, they can do a better job. Thank you for that challenge, and thank you for, <laughs> thank you Ms. Jones, Ms. Groninger, Ms. Jumphy, for um, really a very stimulating conversation and um, telling us how much has been done, but how much still has to be done. So I think we have time for a break at this point, but thank you all. How is everyone? Good. My name is Mary Catherine Scott, and I'm the acting director of the Civil Law Clinic here at Widener Law Commonwealth. I've been at Widener for, since 2002. And at the Civil Law Clinic, we train second and third year law students in the hands-on representation of real live clients. Um, we, where do we get our clients? We get our clients from Mid Penn Legal Services and the Dauphin County Area Agency on Aging, but I'll talk about that elder population in a few minutes. Uh, the students are instructed in substantive areas of the law and then they are assigned cases. We're set up like a small law firm where the students are the young associates and the supervising attorneys are more of the senior associates or the partners. And we train them in the substantive areas of the law and then they are assigned these cases. And the students will represent these clients from beginning to end in their representation. So they interview the clients, they research their legal issues, they, um, draft their legal documents, they correspond with um, uh, opposing counsel, and ultimately they represent them in court and administrative proceedings. So we prepare the students for the real world, and, and that's, what, that's what real lawyers want. Lawyers in the real world want uh, young associates that are practice ready, and we do that here at Widener Law Commonwealth. So I mentioned earlier, where do we get our clients? Well, we get our clients, as I said, mid-pen legal services, and we heard earlier about what those kinds of clients are, their poverty level. We heard, you know, they're poor. Those are the clients that we represent. In addition, um, from the Dauphin County Area Agency on El Aging, we get elderly clients. So our clients are poor, they're elderly, and mostly they're both. Um, uh, through our relationship with aging, we get a variety of referrals that help our residents in Dauphin County. And I'll highlight a couple of those legal areas where we represent. First is social security issues, social security disability. We represent clients. We represent clients in simple estates, estate planning, uh, simple wills, powers of attorney, advanced health care directives. We represent in consumer law, uh, credit card debt collection. Our, our clients come to us with huge credit card bills. Uh, they can't afford to pay their medical bills. They can't afford their living expenses. So therefore, they're being sued you know, for payment. We represent in um, housing, landlord-tenant issues. We represent in family law. We heard earlier about the, the trend, the, the awful trend of grandparent custody cases that we have at the clinic. Um, our clients come to us because they're left with raising their grandchildren because their own children are um, either in, incarcerated or, you know, addicted to opioids, as we heard earlier. So we help them get the children into school, um, get the medical attention that they need. We also have a significant practice in guardianships. We represent in orphans court, in guardianships, in capacitation hearings. So a multitude of um, areas of the law that really affect the elder Pennsylvanians, especially in, in Dauphin County. Um, so we're able to help get some of our senior uh, clients in Dauphin County help that they would not normally receive. And in fact, um, every semester we take a group of students to a senior living high rise in, in, uh, in uh, Harrisburg, Benai Brith, and uh, our students present on areas of elder law, areas where we represent two groups of um, uh, area seniors. Um, they don't even have to leave their home. We go there, we present, and um, then we sit one-on-one, -on -one, the student with the client representing. Um, also, in April, we're taking a group of students to the Dauphin County Area Agency on Aging 
Elder Justice Task Force, and our students will be presenting on um, areas mainly in protective services, some guardianships and capacitations and things like that. So clinic students are not only given an opportunity to, to get real world um, practice and real world experience after graduation, but in addition, because of the type of client we represent, the indigent, the elderly, our hope at the clinic is to um, be able to instill a sense of public service and pro bono work ethic in our, in our clinic students that will carry with them when they graduate and become members of, of the bar. As a result of my work at uh, Widener's Clinic, this last year I was appointed by the Supreme Court to the Advisory Council on Elder Justice to the Courts. And the mission statement I'll read to you is, um, of the council is to identify and address elder justice issues, including elder abuse and neglect, guardianships and access to justice affecting the Commonwealth's elders. And then we report to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Uh, the liaison to the Supreme Court is Madam Justice Deborah Todd, and the council is chaired by Superior Court Judge Paula Francisco Ott, and our co-chair is Zygmunt Pines, and he's here with us today. Members of the council are common pleas judges, state and county government administrators, private attorneys, and other experts in elder justice law. And um, it's been a, a truly an honor to be um, invited and appointed to, to sit on this council. As I am the only representative, I represent Widener Law Commonwealth to the council, and so that's been quite, quite an honor for me. Um, we meet four times a year. And uh, in between, we have teleconferences and video conference really addressing you know, some of the, some of the um, problems with um, our elderly in and um, addressing and identifying the needs of elder Pennsylvanians throughout the Commonwealth. And the past couple of years, there have been significant contributions from the Advisory Council, and I'd like to highlight a few. There are many, but one of the most visible and I think the most important has been the creation and the implementation of the GTS which is the Guardianship Tracking System. This is a web-based system established as a mecha mechanism for orphans courts, clerks, judges, guardians to file, manage, track, and report on guardianships. The system permits orphans courts to better monitor active guardianships through the statewide reporting process. The system also permits guardians to file electronically their inventories and annual reports to the court, and the system can flag potential concerns dealing with um, loss and neglect. And I can speak to at least um, in Dauphin County and talking to the courts here in Orphan's Court that it has been quite, um, quite a benefit to the court with regard to tracking and organizing the data of the many guardianships um, statewide. It has gone live, and in Dauphin County, it was actually um, test tested here, so we got to see it firsthand and, and hopefully get some of the kinks um, out of the system. And also, um, I can speak as it's a win-win for both the courts and for the guardianships in the practice in the clinic. Um, the guardians have expressed to me that it's been um, you know, quite simple. It's been very easy to be able to report on their inventories and the annual reports um, directly online and not have to file the paper documents or go to Orphan's Court. So it's really been a, quite a significant accomplishment from the Advisory Council. Other administrative mechanisms have been enacted to aid Pennsylvania elders through the guidance of the Council, and I'll name a few. Um, there's been a case management systems system for common pleas and magisterial district judges to track criminal cases in which the victim is 60 years of age or older for data collection and tracking um, dealing with crimes against the, the elders of Pennsylvania. Amending the Pennsylvania Crimes Procedural Code to ensure that testimony of elder victims and witnesses in criminal cases is pre preserved should the victim or the witness have memory loss or pass away. Creating an Elder Justice Resource Center in Philadelphia's City Hall, where the public um, initially could obtain information and resources, um, but now it's expanded, and um, now the, the, um, the center provides legal representation through volunteer attorneys, so that's expanded. Another significant contribution has been the completion of extensive amendments to the Pennsylvania Orphans Court rules that are scheduled to be, be adopted this summer. These rules will provide increased efficiencies and oversights to guardianships. And in fact, some of the new forms that had been adopted are already been in use and they have been since July of last year. 
The council also recognizes the importance of education and training on elder justice. This includes education for judges, attorneys, district attorneys, guardians, members of the banking industry, and in fact, a guardianship bench book for orphans courts judges is scheduled to be released very shortly, um, as well as an elder abuse bench book that provides information to all judges about elder abuse and not just um, to orphans court judges because elder abuse really affects um, and impacts all areas of the judiciary. Finally, the council has initiated programs to provide public awareness of elder abuse and provide access to information and resources to the general public. Members of the, uh, the advisory council engage in presentations and public forums of, um, and speak on sub subjects affecting elders ranging from financial exploitation to domestic violence. So at this time, I think um, I'm, it's, we're gonna show a movie, um, a short video that deals with um, a, a very important resource in, resource in Pennsylvania, the, the um, Senior Law Center in Philadelphia. One of my colleagues on the advisory council is the executive director. Her name is Karen Buck. And this film, I think, will highlight the assistance it provides not only for um, seniors in Philadelphia, but through the uh, senior helpline all throughout Pennsylvania, all throughout the Commonwealth. So. Okay.
For the last panel of the day, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. First, we have Lucia Ann Seleccia, who has taught at Catholic University's Columbus Law School since 1991. Professor Seleccia was one of nine Americans to participate in a Vatican Conference on Climate Change and Development organized by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. She has participated in the Association of Religiously Affiliated Law Schools and hosted the 2008-2009 Conference on Catholic Legal Thought. In December 2016, she began service as an expert to the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See to the United Nations, assisting on matters related to the, to the elderly, people with disabilities, and ecology. Professor. Thank you very much, and it is a pleasure to be here. Um, the hospitality from everybody at Widener has just been amazing, and the chance that I've had to uh, just learn from so many other people was just uh, wonderful for me. My thoughts on this topic are on a slightly different track um, because I've come to uh, take a look at these issues in a number of different ways. Um, and when I was first invited uh, to speak at this conference, I looked at the title of this program, and it's What Happens to You After You've Built the Present? And that strikes me as an extremely poignant question to ask, um, because what happens to you is really asking what happens to us uh, after we've built the present. Um, and this question recognizes that at the heart of this inquiry today is a question of what happens to those who have given years of their youthful strength to their communities and to their families and now are asking those same communities and those fa same families for help in return. And that question, what happens to us, also has that element of uncertainty to it. When we're most scared, the question we ask is what's going to happen? And so I appreciate this chance to take a look at it. Um, and this topic is a very timely one for me, um, both personally and academically. And um, I teach in the area of trust and estates, among other things. And when I first started teaching in that area, it was a pretty straightforward, if not technical, uh, class. Um, students would ask this question, how do we help our clients manage their property at death if they are fortunate enough to have property that they're going to pass on to their loved ones after their passing? Um, but more recently, particularly among those who are not wealthy, that's not the most important question that they're asking anymore. Instead, the question is, how do we support ourselves in the last years of our lives? Demographic changes, increased life expectancy, although for the first time in the last couple of years, we've actually seen a slight decline uh, in life expectancy. Higher health care costs, nursing home costs, uh, less reliable pensions, as we've discussed, uh, makes planning for one's own life a much more pressing and urgent concern even than thinking about what happens uh, after death. Um, so what I'd like to do is address some of these questions, uh, not as much as legal questions or as economic questions, but really talk a little bit about uh, elder justice as a moral question. Um, and this moral urgency, I would argue, grows greater the more vulnerable the particular elders happen to be. So whether that vulnerability is based on race, poverty, social isolation, or physical or mental impairment, the challenges are exacerbated when these things intersect. My thoughts of the, on this have been shaped by three things. Um, first, much of my research involves the analysis of legal issues, um, particularly uh, elder care, through uh, a religious lens. And although I look at this through my own tradition, I think when we look at what various faith traditions have to say, they talk a lot about obligations, moral obligations, to the elderly. And in that tradition, I find themes about the dignity of all people, especially the vulnerable and suffering, the need for holistic physical support and economic support for sure, but also social, emotional, and spiritual support, and the importance of assisting struggling families who are trying to care for elders. I find themes that speak of the preferential option for those who are impoverished in any way, and the importance of solidarity in the ways in which we relate to each other. 
many religious traditions speak of the importance of respect for elders and their irreplaceable role in society, and yet we contrast that to what we've heard today about the theme of our elders far from being respected, but often being almost thrown away when they become invisible in our lives. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes reflecting on religious uh, perspectives on aging uh, is a quote from uh, Pope John Paul II who wrote this right before he passed away. And he said, the elderly must be considered in their dignity as persons, which does not diminish during the passing years or with physical or mental deterioration. A positive view can flourish only in a culture capable of transcending social stereotypes which judge a person's worth on the basis of youth, efficiency, physical vigor, or perfect health. And I fear sometimes that, that is something that uh, we may be doing. Um, the second uh, lens through which I've looked at these issues is an international one. Um, more recently, I have been working uh, for the Holy See um, as one of their experts at the UN, and I've been following in that uh, capacity some of the activities of the United Nations uh, with respect to elders. Um, and so, in particular, there is currently now an open-ended working group on aging. Um, and they've been convening for several years, and one of the things that they are discussing uh, at their meetings um, is whether or not it makes sense to create an international covenant on the rights of older persons. And I mention that to illustrate that the questions that we're discussing here today are being asked the world over. Um, and I have ambivalent feelings about the value of some of these conventions, but what would be proposed would be a binding international instrument addressing the rights of elders in a comprehensive way, the way we uh, currently do with the conventions on the rights of children, the rights of persons with disabilities, um, and the rights of women. And whatever the outcome of those deliberations are, um, and I'm happy uh, to address those, one of the things that those discussions highlight is some of the demographic changes that we're seeing here in the United States, we see worldwide. Um, and at the same time, one of the things I'm struck with during those discussions uh, is the ways in which all of these issues that we're discussing, uh, the rights of the elderly to such things as food, medical care, housing, security, assistance in time of disaster, are the elderly included even in the disaster plans? These are important, but so often whether or not a person has those things when they are elderly is almost entirely dependent on whether they had them when they were younger. And so uh, these themes, as important as it is to have a moral awakening to the needs of our seniors, it's very hard to play catch up if we ignore these issues for the first 50, 60, or 70 years of life. And third, I've been thinking about these issues uh, more personally lately in my own family as I have watched uh, both of my parents grow into their late 80s and then recently and in close proximity to each other uh, passed away. And I learned firsthand how difficult it is to make decisions about medicine, money, health care, and home care. And when I thought about that, my parents were not wealthy, but we had so many uh, advantages. My father sold insurance for over 40 years, and they had insurance, which is a wonderful gift when it comes uh, to health care. Um, they had two lawyers in the family. We were native uh, English speakers. Um, they had a home. Uh, my employer could not have been more supportive of my running back and forth from D.C. to New York three times a week. All luxuries I didn't realize that I had. Um, they had a faith community they were a part of. And my mother lived 87 years, three blocks from the house she was born in. So there was that social interaction. And I thought all through that, if this is so hard when we have all these advantages, how difficult is this for so many people in so many places? And so I just want to reflect on six, uh, very briefly uh, raise six moral themes that, to keep in the back of our minds as we look at uh, these issues. Um, the, these thoughts are in no particular order, but they reflect some of the moral questions I think we have to ask ourselves if we are to keep our elders in a loving embrace at the end of their lives. 
they're also important questions for elders to consider themselves. And one of the things that always makes me nervous is when we talk about people rather than with them. And so I hope these are questions that uh, elders themselves uh, are asked to think about so that they are active participants in these decisions. Um, the first is a broad question. Uh, we have to consider how we can best offer not merely care and financial and economic security, but also love and compassionate care in an increasing population by supporting family caregivers. And then we've touched on this before, uh, but elder law in particular is an area in which the presence of true love, true affection found in the embrace of family and friends is something that cannot be underestimated. And in elder care, we have so many examples of care that is provided by individuals and family members who need a great deal of support. And until recently, and this has been changing in some uh, very good but very slow ways, um, some government programs tended to favor institutional provision of elder care rather than home care, even though home care is more common, economical, and overwhelmingly favored. And I'm so pleased to hear of initiatives Sometimes it is the smallest thing that can make that difference between someone's ability to remain in their home. But we have to see what resource we, resources we can allocate to support family caregivers so that we recognize how to support those family members who play this irreplaceable role. And while situations in which an elderly person finds themselves with no one to care for them are tragic, it's also heartrending to see situations in which there is a loved one ready to assume care, wanting to assume care, but can't do so because of the relatively small amount of financial or other support. Um, there is an estimated, and statistics vary, 34.2 million Americans providing unpaid care for family members over the age of 50. Um, back, and the statistics are several years old, but um, the most recent statistics I have, the value of this care was estimated at $470 billion of unpaid care provided to elders in their family. Um, if there are ways we can provide training, respite care, flexible work schedules for family members, and companionship to family care providers, and initiatives to grapple with caregiver stress, which is a um, under-detected, I think, uh, phenomenon, this can go a long way in ensuring the care they provide to family members is not only loving, but competent and effective. Um, traditionally, um, people may have received this care uh, from a spouse, but as we've heard before, the statistics of people who enter old age married, particularly for women, uh, is particularly uh, low. And so it is more important to examine how other people children, grandchildren, siblings, other relatives, neighbors, friends can be uh, supported in this task of love. Many of the issues that uh, involve the provision of supportive family care among children get a lot of attention. And many younger workers, when they look at a job, uh, look at whether or not the job will allow them flexibility for provision of child care, because very often that is on the minds of younger employees. We don't give as much attention, though, to whether or not we do the same thing for providing for employees who want to meet that moral obligation to their family. Second, I think it's important to think more broadly about the care that our elders require. Our policies can often focus almost exclusively or primarily on providing financial and material assistance. And I think that has to be the starting point, and that's what our public institutions uh, can do best. But we have to make sure that we don't exclude spiritual and emotional needs. And this is far harder to do and far more difficult to do, and yet important. An increasing body of literature touts the importance of the spiritual life and emotional support in difficult seasons of life. Thus, in the training of elder care professionals, this should be part of the discussion and part of the emphasis. Religiously affiliated institutions who provided a significant amount of elder care in the past are becoming less plentiful, as many uh, elderly religious need those services themselves. But we may look to ways in which religious institutions and faith communities may help train 
family members to provide for emotional and spiritual support. This might not be in the direct provision of services, but again, in helping those who assist others. Throughout life, community is a critical, important part of a healthy life. This does not change with age, and we must be vigilant in ensuring that our efforts to provide for material care don't come at the expense of or overlooking the, these needs, which are less tangible. Among elders in the United States today, the tenth leading cause of death is suicide, a testament to the importance of attention to emotional and psychological care, as well as physical and financial care. Third, as the need for elder care workers increase, it is also vitally important, and I would say a moral imperative, to consider how these employees who provide professional care to strangers can be assisted in seeing this as a vocation of service rather than a mere job. And yet, when you look at how our priorities are set, those who work in this demanding field of elder care are paid very, very little. They are predominantly women, and they work under stressful physical and emotional conditions, often underappreciated by the family of the elders they care for. And the elders they care for may not be able to express their appreciation uh, given their conditions. We often find ourselves focused on the abuse of elders by caregivers because the number of elders who suffer abuse is shocking. Um, some estimates place this rate at over 25% when financial, physical, emotional, sexual, and psychological abuse are factored in. And equally shocking, although not surprising, is that so little of this is reported. Um, current figures I've seen over about 7%. And I say this isn't surprising because when you think about those most likely to be abused, they're the people least likely to be able to report it because they are often dependent on the person who has abused them. Um, they often may be fearful that they will lose that care. And something so simple about how many elders have a cell phone. Um, and that is often the way we would reach out for help, how much communication is not available. And so we focus on this, but it's also true that sometimes professional caregivers are subject to abuse. And we have to be very careful uh, that people who are in that profession are respected. It's a high stress environment. And it's important to think about ways to attract and retain loving and generous caregivers for this task by ensuring that we pay people at a, an appropriate way for doing such important and difficult work. As the elderly population increases, the shortage of these caregivers will be exacerbated and more keenly felt in the years ahead. This is becoming more true as serious ongoing illnesses and chronic conditions rather than sudden death are what most of our uh, seniors are living with. Um, the top causes of death are long-running diseases that often require many years of care by a limited pool of care, uh, caregivers and care provided. With the burnout of those who are already in the elder care field, combined with a disinclination of young professionals to enter into this field, it's important to consider how to inspire loving service in this profession. Better pay, more secure benefits, and greater respect in the workplace are ways of acknowledging the importance of this line of work or this vocation for service. But we have to be more creative in considering measures such as scholarships for those who are entering in the field of elder care or programs of long-term service uh, for uh, providing elder care that mimic some of the programs we provide in education. For younger members of minority communities who are a significant segment of elder care providers, elder care might be a pathway to a rewarding career in health care, but we have to ensure that this work is better compensated more secure and a pathway to a secured future rather than a stressful, exhausting minimum wage job. Third, uh, fourth rather, I would argue we need to focus more heavily on the concept of intergenerational solidarity as we think about the care of the elderly to avoid what can all too often become an us versus them zero sum game. Certainly within the family, there are multiple generations, and we've talked about the ways in which the same people within the family may be talking about uh, caring for multiple generations. But beyond the family, we have to have greater solidarity among the various age cohorts currently alive. And 
So we have to look at the needs among these various groups, and all too often in discussions, I find that sometimes the tensions between different groups are particularly uh, divisive, particularly uh, when those distinctions are generational. If we have limited resources, each, each dollar spent on Social Security, one less that's spent on early childhood education, is payment of a generous pension a benefit that comes at the expense of health insurance benefits for young employees? Is expenditure on social services for one population incompatible uh, with the expenditure for social services on another generation? And I think that's an unhealthy way of thinking about how we as a society wish to work, um, focusing on this war again between other generations. Um, but instead, uh, it is time to think to a greater extent about the ways in which we support our young, indirectly supports our elderly population, and the ways in which we support our elderly population is both an expression of gratitude for what they did when they were younger, but also an expression of the dignity of the old age to which all of us uh, hope to aspire. Uh, fifth, I think we have to uh, think about uh, the issues pertaining to the elderly as very much a part of our discussion of women's issues. And very often, the traditional canon of women's issues, I fear, is looked at quite narrowly focusing on the interests of younger, healthier women, particularly in the employment and childbearing context, without recognizing that these uh, uh, issues um, that pertaining to the elderly disproportionately impact women and should be part of a concern for anyone who's concerned about the broad range of issues that impact women. Um, we've seen some of these statistics before. More of the elderly are women. Uh, they, on average, outlive men by five years. Um, thus, the chronic disabilities and illnesses of age impact women uh, more directly. Women represent 65% uh, of care recipients. They're also likely to be poorer than men in old age. And while this may change with time, many of today's oldest women may be less likely to have savings of their own than their male counterparts. They are less likely to have had a higher education or paid employment, which would have offered a pension and benefits in their own name rather than through a spouse. Thus, while women are a greater percentage of the elderly population, they are disproportionately higher uh, in the poor elderly population. And then there's a the cruel irony that we spoke of before, that the women who take time off to care for their own children or their own parents are statistically more likely to pay for this underappreciated generosity by a decline in their own financial well-being. This can manifest itself in a decline in their Social Security payments, their likelihood to accept a job or have available to them a job with a pension. Um, it also may mean that they are less likely to have good health insurance and not likely to find perhaps diseases that might be impacting them earlier than somebody who had earlier and better access to health care or time to go and see a doctor when they were not feeling well. Um, the other uh, field that's getting a little bit more attention now than I think it should um, is the importance, and I know this sounds... Um, somewhat trivial, but the statistics on the consequences of sleep deprivation are uh, in terms of long-term impact on health, including is it a risk factor to some of the diseases in old age? That affects women in particular who are trying to balance child care, elder care, a job with benefits all at the same time. So um, the moral obligation of taking care of uh, women in particular who might have multiple vulnerabilities is particularly uh, important. Um, the average age of the unpaid female family caregiver is between 49 and 51 years old, which is precisely the age while children have uh, significant needs and parents. And it's significantly lower for minority communities, averaging 44 years old for African American women and 42 years old for Hispanic Americans, which may mean their children are younger at that point in time and in need of greater care. Um, so the service provided by women hidden but needs more attention and practical support. Um, and then finally, say at the end of life, um, a great deal of care must be paid to the discriminatory provision of medical care at the very end of life. Um, at the most obvious level, hospitals in poorer communities may have a lower range of and quality of services. So we've talked about 
nursing home care, but I worry in particular about the impact of hospital care as well. A patient's inability to pay for care or the perception that they are unable to pay for care may lead to decisions about the nature of the care they will be provided. This certainly plays itself out among the young, but among the elderly, uh, it is particularly problematic because they are a larger um, consumer of medical services and may be less likely to have someone who can advocate for themselves. And so we have this concern about the objective quality of care, but I would also argue there are more subtle forms of discrimination uh, that we can see. The one that discourages some from beneficial treatment because their perceived quality of life might be undervalued. The one that might discourage patients from asking questions or seeking opinions, seeking second opinions, or seeking aggressive uh, treatment that is medically indicated because maybe they don't have someone at home to help them follow up. All of these are ways in which we should urge caution uh, in those initiatives that uh, might disproportionately impact those in minority communities because even if the statutes, even if the rules, even if the medical care uh, states that it will be the same, we have to be uh, taking a look at the moral obligations of those providing the medical care to ensure that some of these biases uh, don't come into play in their care. Uh, where does that leave us? Um, the question you asked today is a very important one. Uh, and it's an important question to ask, certainly in the context of racial disparities, because some of the statistics about the disproportionate impact are sobering. Um, and yet, while these disparities can divide us, I think planning ahead for aging is also something that should unite us. Uh, because with the passage of time, if we're fortunate, all of us are going to face these challenges that we have been talking about today. And age is coming for uh, all of us, and no amount of planning uh, can allow us to control with complete detail how that last chapter of our lives is going to be. And so from a moral perspective, what we owe each other is thinking about the the issues pertaining to aging as moral dilemmas, so we, that's the New York accent coming out, moral dilemmas, um, so that we can ensure that the answers that we come up with for today's elders, those who might be particularly vulnerable, are the answers that we would want for those questions when we ourselves are in their places. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, our last speaker today is Mr. John Scott. Mr. Scott directs the Pew Charitable Trust Retirement Savings Project, which conducts original research and works with experts and policymakers to understand the barriers to retirement savings in the United States, policy initiatives that might increase retirement savings, and the extent to which strengthening the disclosure of fees can help employers and employees make better de decisions about retirement plans. Before jo joining Pew, Mr. Scott taught and conducted research on public policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with a focus on issues relating to aging, tax policy, and the policy making process. Mr. Scott? Thank you. So, how, do we have any current uh, law students still in the room? Can you just sort of raise your hands? I'm just sort of curious. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. That's great. Good for you. Um, I, I have to say that. Uh, I graduated from Dickinson, just down the road in Carlisle, uh, 30 years ago. And uh, so I'm really glad to see students here in the room um, taking advantage of this uh, because, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about retirement plans in a second, but what got me into sort of employee benefits law was a course at Dickinson. It was the first course ever offered on employee benefits law um, in the spring of my third year. And I, I just really thought it was fascinating, really interesting. and. Um, but it was taught by someone who was a practitioner. He came up from D.C. to teach the course. And so I think these sorts of interactions are really helpful when you're a student. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. And I just want to say thank you uh, to Widener. This is a great conference. 
Um, I've learned a lot, uh, echoing what Lucia uh, just said, and um, really I think the connections, um, whether it's retirement plans or caregiving or nursing homes or housing, transportation, uh, you know, we have different speakers, but um, these issues are interconnected. So um, I work, uh, as was mentioned, I work for the Pew Charitable Trust. It's a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan research organization. Uh, we do a lot of research across a wide uh, range of topics from stopping illegal fishing to um, child, uh, children's health care to retirement savings, which is uh, what I do. Um, so just in terms of, of an overview, um, and there are uh, some prior speakers who cast dispersions on the use of statistics or showing statistics on slides. I'm going to do that, and you're going to like it. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, but I'm going to actually go pretty quickly, um, in part um, because the prior panel also covered a lot of what I, I thought I was going to talk about, um, including Keith uh, mentioned some things I'm going to talk about a little bit, too. So, but I do want to set the stage by talking about wealth and short-term savings because I think that is a big part of the picture when we talk about retirement security. Um, then I'll focus a little bit, you know, a little more detail or drill down a little bit on retirement savings and income security in old age. And then what I'd like to spend a little bit more time on are policy initiatives that address sort of these um, uh, gaps, uh, racially based gaps in old age income security. So. Um, let me just see. OK, so here's, here's the uh, statistics I'm going to slap you around with. So I first want to start with median and mean family wealth. So um, as my daughter, who's taking statistics, uh, will tell you, the median is the midpoint in the distribution. Uh, and then mean is the average. And, and I always like to show the median, because uh, I think that's really important, I think more informative than the average. But in this case, I think both are, are very helpful. So what you see, for example, with whites, um, the median uh, uh, wealth holding is $171,000. And the mean is $933,700. And in a similar sort of spread between the median and the mean for um, African Americans and Hispanics. Well, what does this mean? I, well, I think you can very easily see across uh, racial and ethnic groups um, a fair amount of inequality, but also you see a lot of inequality within um, each uh, racial and ethnic group. So we see a lot of uh, different kinds of inequality uh, going on here. Um, and we've seen some recovery in wealth, largely due to the, uh, the rise of the stock market since the recession. Um, but it, interestingly, or you know, um, um, but problematically, uh, the, the white-black gap in median net worth, median net worth, increased from $132,000 uh, to $153,000 uh, just in the past uh, few years. So there's some, some troubling signs in terms of the bigger um, wealth picture. Um, housing, is a, as was mentioned before, is an important asset uh, in retirement. Um, and here we're looking at just before uh, the, the collapse of the housing market in 2008 and sort of the recovery since then. Um, and you can see the percentage change on the uh, far right-hand side. Um, both whites and blacks saw a similar decrease in their, their home asset values uh, over this time period. Um, Hispanics were particularly hard hit uh, by the housing crisis because they were over-concentrated in certain states that really bore the brunt, uh, states like Nevada, California, Florida, and the like. So they have, uh, they have a long ways to go in terms of recovering of their, of their assets. Um, I also want to talk about short-term savings because I think this is um, pretty important when we think about retirement savings. When I was um, a young attorney uh, going out working for a financial services firm, we went to meet with clients and we met with employees to talk about retirement plans and how their 401k worked. And a lot of workers would come up to me and say, that's great, I know I need to save for retirement, but you know, can I get the money if I need it? Can I get the money if I have an emergency? And so the short-term savings is very much connected to retirement savings or long-term savings. And here, uh, we also see um, uh, liquid savings being uh, sort of uh, dis disproportionately um, uh, distributed. So um, whites have enough liquid savings to last them 31 days in terms of their expenses, which is pretty bad. You should have about six months worth of short-term savings. And if you lose your job, you should be able to live for six months on your, on your short-term savings. 
Um, African Americans only had five days short term stay home. Um, here are just uh, some trends in terms of earnings. This will be important for a point I'm going to make in a second. Um, but, you know, I talked about Hispanics really sort of uh, taking uh, the brunt of the housing crisis. Um, African Americans really saw a huge hit in earnings um, as a result of the um, uh, Great Recession. And you can see that there, the median earnings, and this is the median earnings in the lowest quartile, so the bottom 25% of the population. So at the median, um, uh, African American earnings were basically cut in half. They really have not recovered um, since the Great Recession, where we've seen some recovery um, in the other um, uh, groups. So um, that was also uh, supposed to be a setup for uh, to talk about retirement security, and. Uh, let me just make a few sort of general points. So um, retirement security is a function, uh, in this country at least, of employer-provided retirement plans and social security. You know, we used to call this uh, a three-legged stool, employer-provided plans, social security, and then uh, private savings and, uh, and you know, private assets. But since we really don't have any private savings to speak of, it's really a two-legged stool um, at this point. And I, I do want to mention or make the point that uh, this is a voluntary system in the sense that uh, employers are not required to provide a, a retirement plan. Um, and it, it is largely an employer-based system. Less than 15% of Americans save for retirement outside of a workplace plan. So the vast uh, majority of, of the assets that are, that are generated in this country in the retirement system, which is you know, roughly about 15 to $20 trillion, is, is works through employer-provided uh, retirement plans. Um, and this is done through uh, largely the tax system. Uh, the tax system provides incentives uh, to employers to offer retirement plans. They provide, it provides deductions for contributions made by employers. Um, it also provides tax breaks for workers who are saving for retirement. So um, the amount you contribute to a retirement plan, your 401k, and the buildup of investment earnings are not taxed until you actually take them out uh, generally in retirement. So, um, and, and this is a big tax break. Um, taxes, uh, the tax breaks for retirement plans is the fourth largest uh, tax break in the system. It, uh, I'm looking at my notes here, uh, for all retirement plans it, in one year, it's worth $212 billion. That's just one year of tax breaks for retirement plans. In comparison, the earned income tax credit which is a tax credit for um, the working poor, is only $72 billion. So um, it's, it's a lot of money that we're talking about for this system. Now, Social Security, the mean annual benefit is uh, $17,532. So really, we, you heard before you know, some talk about Social Security. It's, it's uh, not meant to be a retirement plan. It was social insurance, but it is basically effectively a retirement plan for a lot of folks, particularly people of, of color. You can see it really does not provide a lot of money, you know, and effectively it's just an anti-poverty program uh, for uh, older people, uh, but it's really not something that you want to live on. Um, so this is why retirement savings is so important. Um, there was some conversation in, in the prior session about the decline of the traditional um, pension plan. You know, what's really interesting is, you know, we, we talk about this, and, and this is where I'm sort of disagree with some of our speakers a little bit. Uh, but uh, the, the traditional pension plan, uh, the, the defined benefit pension plan uh, of the olden days, um, a couple of things. One is I don't think they were such great uh, pension plans. For one thing, it didn't really cover as many people as 401k plans cover today. So not everybody got a pension plan um, in the old days. Um, the other thing is quite a few um, pension plans were not funded. They were largely pay-as-you-go uh, pension plans. Um, the very famous case of the Studebaker Automobile Company, uh, which collapsed in 1965. Um, people had worked there for 20 or 30 years. They found out the company had never funded the pension plan. And they were left in their 40s and 50s with absolutely nothing. And so you know, this is a problem. And the federal government responded by requiring companies to start funding their pensions. Along came the 401k as an alternative. Uh, and so we began to see a, a withdrawal from traditional pensions in the 1970s and 1980s in favor of these 401k um, savings programs. Um, so, you know, we're in a situation today where um, current workers um, are basically in a do-it-yourself situation. 
Um, you have to save for retirement. You have to make investment decisions. You have to decide when to retire, when, how much money to take out of your retirement plan. Really, the burden of all those decisions are on you. Um, and so the, the uh, suggestion or the admonition to, the, to you law students, to you young people out there is start saving now um, because it really is, will be all on you. Um, let me see. Now, um, just, a little, just one more thing about Social Security. Uh, you know, it's always a question with retirement plans and Social Security as, as to how much of your income will be replaced in old age. And uh, what you see here is that actually um, African Americans and Hispanics do pretty well um, relative to, to whites in terms of the replacement rate. So this is saying, you know, as of 2016, um, blacks and Hispanics, you know, will on average see about 45% of their pre-retirement income replaced just by Social Security. Now, you might, and compared to whites, at 37%, and you might just look at that and say, oh, you know, that's not so bad. Uh, but keep in mind, again, that prior slide about the collapse of earnings. And so with, you know, with the collapse of earnings, uh, with, for African Americans in particular, they're seeing a lower standard of living. So yes, Social Security will help replace that, that lowered income, but they're still starting off at a pretty low base. Um, so again, I think there's uh, uh, a need for Social Security. Uh, it does a great job, but I think we need to do, uh, go beyond that a bit more to try to better um, standard of living in retirement. So just some key questions that we often ask about retirement savings or retirement policy. Um, who has access to a retirement plan? Um, and are people participating when a plan is available? So access and participation are the key issues. Now, when we think about um, access, um, you know, just about 32% of whites don't have access to a retirement plan at their workplace. Um, uh, blacks and Asians are slightly worse off at about 36 to 38% uh, roughly that lack access to a plan. Um, Hispanics lag far behind with more than half lacking access to a retirement plan at their workplace. And we talk about participating in a plan so this is when you have a plan at your workplace, but you don't, but you don't join it. Um, black workers are somewhat less likely to participate than uh, white workers. Uh, you know, but Hispanics have uh, significantly lower rates of participation. Um, and this was really, we find this differential in participation, even when we control for income, um, we find much lower rates of participation, especially for uh, Latinos. So um, why do these gaps exist? Well, you know, it's, it's easy to say, and, and it is true, that income matters. Um, but I think also the type of job you have, your work status, that is, are you part-time versus full-time? Are you uh, a traditional W-2 employee versus a 1099 worker or gig worker? What kind of industry you work in? How much education you have? Other factors that aren't on the screen, like family uh, situations, all these, I think, uh, factor in. They affect both income and access to uh, retirement benefits. So um, I mentioned that this is a voluntary system. It's voluntary uh, for employers. So if we want to improve access, one of the things we might want to think about is how can we get more employers to offer retirement plans? Um, one of the key issues is that small employers don't offer retirement plans. Uh, and they're half as likely, as the slide says, to offer retirement benefits as larger employers. And certain industries have especially low levels of coverage, so construction, certain areas of retail, leisure and hospitality. And we see uh, ethnic and racial concentrations within certain industries. So you know, access to retirement plans is sort of structured by industry as well. Now, small employers, we did some research. We surveyed uh, small business owners, and they said the, the one of the key barriers in offering retirement benefits to their workers uh, was the cost of starting a plan. A lot of small businesses don't have a lot of extra money. Um, they have very thin margins. They also don't have a lot of administrative capacity. The business owner is wearing multiple hats, um, and taking on a retirement plan is, is pretty complicated. And there's also a perceived lack of demand. We, uh, we heard in focus groups uh, that business owners said, you know, my workers are living hand to mouth. They don't really have any extra income. Um, so they're not likely to, to want a retirement plan. However, when we did focus groups with workers around the country uh, who worked for small businesses, 
a lot of people said, yes, I, I know I need to save for retirement. I just don't have an opportunity to save. I don't really have an effective way to save for retirement, even though it's, I know it's something I should do. So I think there's a mismatch here in terms of uh, perceptions. So in this last issue here is, um, which comes up a lot in, in my world, is uh, should low-income workers save? Um, and this is an argument that sort of is reflective you know, in part by what those owners said. But a lot of policymakers are wondering, you know, look, Social Security is an anti-poverty program. It really replaces a lot of income. We have Medicare. We have other sorts of programs that help, you know, the very sort of people at the bottom of the income distribution. Um, do we really want people to take money out of their paychecks uh, and sort of uh, affect their consumption? And, and I think this is a, is a key issue. And I, I think on the one hand, there's a concern that if you sort of take money out of people's paychecks, you know, are they going to run up credit card debt or, you know, are they going to um, suffer in some way? But on the other hand, uh, and this is sort of where I come down on this issue, and I'm happy to talk about this afterwards, um, Social Security, as I said, is pretty small. Medicare doesn't cover every health situation, although we like to think it does. It doesn't. Um, there are a lot of financial shocks that occur in old age. Um, I was at a hearing at the Philadelphia City Council where um, one resident uh, in her 60s said, you know, I had a little extra money from savings. When my roof needed to be repaired, I was able to get it repaired. It was only $4,000, but it kept me in my house longer. So I think when we think about retirement savings, we tend to think, oh, they won't be able to save enough to live on it in retirement. But Thinking about it in, instead as sort of a buffer against the financial shocks that are inevitable at any age, um, you know, keeping somebody in their home, paying for an unexpected medical bill that's not covered by Medicare or insurance, um, I think those are critical things, and I think that's where um, some retirement savings can be very effective. Okay, so solutions. Um, so I put uh, I put a few things up here, and but I, I do want to sort of get back to this. Um, traditional pensions um, idea that was brought up in the, the Q&A. So one idea, of course, is to strengthen or expand uh, Social Security. Um, as you probably know, Social Security is set to run out of money uh, in about uh, 15 to 20 years. And even though I don't think benefits will be cut, because that's politically um, suicide, uh, but, but it's out there. Um, so you know, I, I think at the very least, we have to shore up Social Security, and that's, that's not going to be cheap. Um, there's there's going to be some political pain there. So that's going to be a difficult uh, lift. Um, another thing is probably something you haven't heard about, but it's the saver's credit. So this is through the tax code. Uh, we offer a tax credit to people, uh, low-income people, who've saved for retirement. It's worth up to $2,000 for single filers and I think uh, $4,000 for uh, joint filers. But it's a non-refundable tax credit. That is, uh, it only applies if you have a tax liability. So it'll offset any tax liability you have. Well, for a lot of low-income people, a lot of people of color, they don't have tax liabilities, so it doesn't really help them. So one of the ideas that's being kicked around in Washington is let's expand the savers credit and make it um, a refundable tax credit uh, so that you know, even if you don't have a tax liability, you, know, you could qualify for another $500 uh, given directly to you, much like the earned income tax credit. And it could actually act as a matching contribution uh, to encourage people to save for retirement. Um, we know from the private sector, matching contributions from employers have a big impact on people participating. So that's one idea, but obviously it's costly um, and would add to the deficit. So that's a political uh, issue there. As was mentioned during the Q&A, um, there's a lot of re really interesting things going on uh, around the states. And in particular, there are five states that are, they're actually implementing statewide retirement savings programs. And there are Connecticut, Connecticut, uh, Connecticut, California, Illinois, Maryland, and Oregon. And these are really, I think, cool social experiments uh, and could have a huge impact. Um, and uh, Keith, my friend Keith there mentioned this during his comment, but just to expand a little bit on this, so workers in these five states, if they don't have a retirement plan at their job, they are automatically enrolled in the statewide savings program. And what that means is, you know, they, they start contributing, and it's usually about 5% of pay to this uh, savings program. Um, the money is invested in a conservative fund. 
um, the worker has control over this. They can decide not to participate. They can add more. They can you know, cut their contributions. They can change their investment options. But it's uh, bringing more people into the system. And the idea is that people, as I mentioned, they don't save for retirement on their own. If they don't have a workplace plan. They're automatically enrolled. Um, they'll stay in the program. And uh, what we're seeing, uh, the first state that's implementing this is the state of Oregon. Uh, they've started enrolling uh, private sector workers in the statewide retirement savings program. They have about nearly 70,000 uh, individuals who are now saving for retirement. They're saving at an average rate of 5.6%, about $100 a month uh, per person. Um, and it's going to roll out to the entire state over the next uh, year and a half or so. California is starting to, well, Illinois is starting to Im implement their program, but California is the one to watch. There are approximately 7 million people in the state of California who don't have access to a workplace retirement plan. Um, and so it's going to roll out to these people. And just to put things in context, the largest retirement plan in the private sector uh, in this country is Walmart at 1.1 million people. Well, California is easily going to be the largest retirement savings program in the country. And it's expected in the first year of operation, it'll amass $2 billion in assets. And these, this, these programs are managed by, they're sort of outsourced to um, private financial firms. They're not part of the state um, public sector pension uh, systems. So these are just pro, you know, uh, separate uh, savings programs. Um, no employer contributions, just employee owned. So this is actually very interesting to see what happens. So in, in these are going to be sort of low-income people, communities of color. How will they respond to being automatically enrolled and having you know, effectively a 5% cut in their paycheck uh, put into this program? So far, we've seen in Oregon about 72% are staying in the program. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of people opting out. Uh, we're seeing a lot of positive response from both the workers involved and from employers involved, but it's still early days. Um, so that is actually something very fascinating, uh, and I, I would expect more states are going to be doing this um, in the near future. Um, the last thing I'm just going to say uh, that goes back to this traditional um, defined benefit pensions is that, you know, I mentioned, you know, I said we're in this DIY retirement program today. You know, we're all sort of in this room. If you're not retired, uh, if, you know, it's on you to save for retirement. Uh, only about 10% of Americans right now have access or, or are part of a traditional pension plan where it's funded by the employer and everything's taken care of for you. But I think at least half of retirees are still receiving pensions in this country. So we really haven't seen the effects of a do-it-yourself retirement savings program play out in terms of old age income security. We are going to be Everybody in this room, in this country, is going to be experiencing that. And, and uh, that's the thing that I'm actually very interested in seeing. I don't think we're going to go back to the traditional pension. Uh, it's just it's not uh, viable. I think employers have voted with their feet. I think what's going to ha if anything's going to happen, I think we might go to some system where we're going to be sharing the risk, where employers, workers, and government will sort of be uh, collaborating to share the risk of saving for retirement, investing, you know, plan, you know, taking the distributions out of the retirement accounts. Um, but I think it's going to take a crisis for us to have a conversation around this. Nobody likes to talk about retirement policy, which makes me sick, so that's what I do every day. Uh, but, um, but I think that's where we're headed. So let me stop there and see if there are any questions for either uh, Lucia or me. Thank you. <laughs> and, and by the way, I just, I just want to, last point, I have my email here for you law students who are interested in sort of non-traditional legal careers, I often say I'm a recovering lawyer, uh, you know, feel free to email me. I'm happy or give me a call. I'm happy to talk to you. Well, we certainly ended the program on two very different topics, didn't we? Uh, moral themes of elder care and wealth management in retirement. So I think we have about 10 minutes and we can open the floor for any questions. Anybody? Any questions for um, Mr. Scott or Professor Salatio? Yeah, so those five states, um, they've passed the legislation. They're in various stages of implementation. Oregon's already rolling it out. Employers, I, I think it's like 20,000 employers are part of the program. Illinois just started 
month or two ago, and California is, gonna, is sort of piloting the program, just starting to you know, you know, test it out. So in the other two states, aren't quite there yet. So we're seeing various stages of implementation right now. Uh, the, the short answer is no. So they're, they're, um, they're in IRAs, so just like the IRAs that you would get at a bank or a financial institution. Um, these are traditional, or I shouldn't say traditional, that's a term of art. They're in Roth IRAs, so it's after-tax money because it's being taken out of people's paychecks on an after-tax basis, put into an IRA that's held by a custodian just like any other IRA. But there's no guarantee by the state uh, there's no sort of insurance around it. There has been some discussion in other states about whether that's something that could be done. Um, and I think it's, uh, but I think a lot of these early states are just trying to get the savings program off the ground. Um, but, you know, I think going to the idea of, you know, these are low income people, they might be concerned, as I said, about having access to the money or certainly not losing money. The, the investments are generally pretty conservative, um, at least to start out. So, you know, I think there's an idea of we want to have sort of a modest, sort of safe program that slowly builds some wealth. You might see some additional bells and whistles over time, but it's, I think that's the general ethos around these. About 80% of employers who offer a 401k make a contribution, um, whether that's a matching or sort of like a discretionary end of year kind of profit sharing kind of contribution. Um, and that, that'll, that tends to vary with the economy. You know, when things are doing well, they do those things. When it's not, they cut back. Um, generally, I want to say the matching contributions hover around 3% of pay, you know, various formulas. but. Um, you know, I have a very generous employer, so that it matches dollar for dollar up to 6% of pay, but that's unusual. It's roughly around 3 to 4% of pay on net. We're ready for lunch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dean Johnson? Thanks, everyone. It's been a terrific morning, chance to... Uh, chance to talk about very important issues and things that are affecting all of us either directly or indirectly through our family members. I want to thank again uh, Professor Randy Lee for putting this together. I'd like to thank all of our participants and our students from our Journal of Law, Economic, and Race. So please join me in thanking them. We have lunch over in the, the building just up uh, on the hill, and we'd like all of you to enjoy us and have a chance to talk about some of these issues uh, uh, more deeply. Thank you.